Foguan Shan presents Buddha Dharma Pure and Simple, Book 1. Written by Venerable Master Xing Un. Read by Arthur Van Seven Dunk. Preface The metaphors of three birds flying in the sky and three animals crossing the river have frequently been used in the Buddhist sutras to depict the notions of distance and depth perceived differently by different beings. Though the concept of distance within the vast sky is inherently non-existent, at the flap of their wings an eagle, a pigeon and a sparrow would span distances ranging from tens of miles to only a couple of miles, and merely a few yards depending on their varying abilities. As a result, the idea of distance is very different to these three birds. In the same way, when an elephant, a horse, and a rabbit cross the river, the elephant's enormous body enables it to tread across the riverbed and reach the far shore without difficulty, while the horse and rabbit, unable to reach the bottom of the river, will struggle as they swim across the river. The Buddha Dharma is like the deep ocean or the vast sky. While people may hold opinions on the differences in levels, there is no saying who is right or wrong, because different levels of faith and spiritual aptitude mean different levels of knowledge. There is no need to think highly of oneself. Which one are you when crossing the river? The elephant, the horse, or the rabbit? Which one are you in the sky? The eagle, the pigeon, or the sparrow? One must constantly self-evaluate. The Buddhist teaching is kind, compassionate, wise, and equal. However, how can we know we have truly understood the profundity of the teaching? If one wants to know the length of a fabric or the weight of an object, one must measure or weigh it. Similarly, we need to measure and weigh the Dharma we think we have understood to know the depth of our faith. Otherwise, we are like a kindergartner who forcefully claims to be a university student, revealing our ignorance to everyone. Is it possible for today's Buddhists to explain the true meaning of Buddhism without going against the original intents of the Buddha? For example, the concept of heaven and hell is to encourage people to transcend and not regress in their spiritual cultivation. However, some ignorantly use the concept of hell to inflict fear upon devotees. Why not use the goodness of heaven as encouragement for the people? There is also the issue of being grateful for the contribution and support devotees give to Buddhism. Often, people say, Amitabha Buddha will be grateful for your contributions. Why are we asking Amitabha Buddha to help us express our gratitude? How can we push this responsibility away? Are we not the ones who should repay this kindness and contribution? Suffering, the fundamental teaching of Buddhism, is a concept that should motivate us to endure hardships, to be hardworking, to train ourselves through austerities because adversity makes us stronger and better. Even a student needs to undergo a decade of education to achieve success and recognition. Hence, suffering makes our lives more meaningful. As the saying goes, out of the worst of the worst pains emerges the best of the best people. Buddhists today, however, often exclaim, Suffering! Suffering! Live no more! Pass away now! Pray to pass away now! This is not the reason why the Buddha expounded the truth of suffering. 
By properly understanding suffering, it pushes us to transcend and be liberated from it. Have these people not been giving the wrong interpretations? For thousands of years, people think the Buddhist term emptiness, or the saying, the four elements are empty, means that nothing exists, that there is nothing to possess, and that everything is empty. As Dharma propagators, how can we elevate people's faith with this nihilistic and ignorant kind of view? Emptiness is meant to be constructive. With emptiness comes existence. For example, where would you sleep if there are no empty rooms? Where would you work if there is no empty desktop to work on? Where would you build a house if there is no empty land? Where would you put your money if your pockets are not empty? How could you survive if your stomach is not empty? Emptiness is so good, so wonderful. So why explain emptiness as nihilism? Emptiness is meant to be full of action, potential, and success. The same goes for the concept of impermanence. Impermanence is wonderful because it means that nothing is fixed. We can thus change, improve, and transcend. Situations can become better, more wholesome, and beautiful. So why make it sound like everything in this world is coming to an end when we explain impermanence? Why make people feel so hopeless? Impermanence is a beacon of hope for Buddhists to learn about the middle way. We have failed to attain the true meaning of Buddhism and thereby misunderstood the intentions of the Buddha. Thus, we must research and restore the true meaning of these Buddhist teachings and propagate them. For over 2,000 years, the Buddha has carried the indignity of those who have been propagating deviant and false views, going against his intents, teaching the Dharma through misunderstanding, superstition, and skewed perspectives, all done in his name. Take the practice of giving as an example. Sometimes, giving others a phrase, a smile, or a service are all acts of giving. However, today's Buddhism explains giving in terms of a monetary donation. The practice of giving does not only mean we ask others to give, but we should be the ones who are willing to let go and offer. Upholding precepts is another cultivation on the path of learning Buddhism. However, it is usually spoken from the perspective of telling others to uphold and follow. What about our actions, minds and speech? Are they following with the Dharma? If we do not have a painful sense of remorse, how can we improve as Buddhists? In an inspiration to give rise to the Bodhi mind, Venerable Sheng An said, The main gate for entering the path is to first give rise to aspirations. To give rise to aspirations means to have right faith and right view. Simply put, the way to practice Buddhism is to cultivate loving-kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity, the four means of embracing, and the six paramitas. However, today, we teach devotees that the practice of the six paramitas consists only of offering incense and venerating in the temple, believing that the act of donation can eradicate calamities. Therefore, Huaynang, the sixth patriarch, admonished in a gata of formlessness, attaining Buddhahood does not come from giving money. However, how many Buddhists have ever taken in the six patriarchs' teachings? We need to raise the issue 
of correcting erroneous views about Buddhism so that the true meaning of the Buddha will not be lost and enhance deeper and proper understanding of the Buddha's original intents. Take the practice of life releasing as an example. To hold a life releasing ceremony, they must first catch fish and birds, and who knows how many lives were killed in the process. So, for those who hold a life releasing ceremony for longevity, how can they live a long life? There are also people without the right understanding of the law of cause and effect, thinking that becoming vegetarians makes them healthy, or praying to the Buddha leads to the acquirement of wealth and fortune. This would be going against the law of cause and effect. There are relative causes and effects for the accumulation of wealth, health and faith. How can we expect to harvest beans when we planted melons? Some people deceive with deeds such as acquiring good fortune by being the first to strike the bell or offer incense on Chinese New Year, turning these activities into superstitions that are not in accord with the Dharma. These people do not understand that the sound of the bell is only to alert us to do good and the burning of incense is an act of offering to the Buddha and should not be done for profit. Moreover, various practices of fortune telling focus only on praying for wishes to be fulfilled instead of focusing on Buddhist cultivation. How can these acts be in accord with cause and effect? What about the geomantic principle of feng shui? Everything has its own principle. For example, there are principles for social interaction, principles for relationships, and principles of material objects. Of course, the geographical environment has its principle. However, geomancy should not only be about searching for the best feng shui for good luck. If your living environment has good air circulation, is hygienic, is balanced with an open view, then it is already in the best geomantic position. Just look at Xuankong Temple, meaning literally hanging temple, in Shanxi, mainland China. Do you think the location can be deciphered with geomancy? Buddhism talks about the eight groups of heavenly beings. Where is heaven? What are the eight groups? We can describe them as different ethnic groups instead of heavenly gods and armies. It is said that the Buddha was born from the right flank of his mother. Did anyone witness this? Why attach so many far-fetched legends to the Buddha? What about the Buddhist councils? There are always people with ulterior motives that include apocryphal sutras and commentary into the Buddhist canon, all under the name of the Buddha. Buddhism has always been mocked as a polytheistic religion because of the many bodhisattvas and arhats who exist. Moreover, most of these figures are only mentioned in the sutras and are not real historical figures. Those with historical references, such as Nagarjuna, Asanga, and Vasubandhu are truly acknowledged. For those with no historical references, who were their parents? Where did they grow up? We need not deny them. Rather, we can consider them as manifestations of the Buddha. Why not place the focus of the faith on the Buddha instead? Why the need for so many deities such as the God of Wealth, God of the City, God of the Hearth, Goddess of Birth and the God of Love? We say that gods created humans, but humans also created gods. Buddhism differs from other religions 
in that the Buddha was an awakened human being. He had a historical background. He was truly a human being, and not a god or goddess that arose from imagination or hearsay. Therefore, the Buddha is the greatest awakened one. Why do Buddhists not return to the Buddha his original face? Hapless Buddha For 2,000 years, he has been shrouded with the coat of superstition and obscured by the masks of deities and ghosts by the so-called devotees. It is a great pity that the Buddha should lose his original identity. For example, Buddhism talks about the four immeasurable vows so that we can make vows and practice them. But today, Buddhists only talk the talk. They dare not walk the walk. If no one practices, what use is there for the four universal vows? Another example is that the Buddha taught the six paramitas so that we understand these as the ways to practice the bodhisattva path. The paramitas of generosity, precept, patience, diligence, meditative concentration, and prajna wisdom are practices of delivering self and others. However, monastics today hold others to the standard of the six paramitas, yet themselves do not give. They wish only to receive. Resultantly, the devotees are the ones who get delivered, while we are still stuck on the other shore. What to do? Monastics go through the teachings of the Buddha for the sake of finding ways to receive gains and benefits. The development of this type of perverse thinking and action can only be subject to the future ruling of the law of cause and effect. There is no law today that ensures the Buddha's teaching is exercised according to his original intents. The foremost practice in this world is the Noble Eightfold Path. In the past, foreigners from the Western regions tried to explain the Noble Eightfold Path. Hence the coining of the term Hu Shuo Ba Dao. However, this term has become an insult for people talking nonsense. How can we answer to the people from the Western regions? Between the Sui and Tang dynasty, some young practitioners studied with eminent Buddhist masters. For a time, they either studied under Chan Master Mazu in Tianxi or Chan Master Xi Qian in Hunan. The term roaming Jianghu refers to their deeds of traveling and learning. However, such a meaningful term has come to mean vagabonds performing their monkey tricks. Who will be the one to correct this? In Buddhism, we also see sutras such as the Vimalakirti Nirdesa Sutra and Srimaladevi Simanada Sutra. Are layman Vimalakirti and Lady Srimala not lay Dharma teachers? Why do we think that the age of declining Dharma is near when lay professors and devotees are teaching the Dharma? This obstructs many outstanding Buddhists from propagating Buddhism. Does fault not lie with those who keep promoting these kinds of deviant sayings? Another example is the term eternal life. Originally, this Buddhist term means that life does not end in death, but continues in the cycle of samsara. However, when Christians promoted that believers will have eternal life, Buddhists were afraid to use this term. Another term is saviour. The Buddha truly is a saviour, for he came to this world to deliver all beings. However, 
Because Christianity proclaimed Jesus Christ the Saviour, Buddhism was afraid to call the Buddha a Saviour. Such beautiful terms are adopted by other religions, while the Buddha becomes associated with improper faiths, miraculous and ghostly incidents, as well as deviant thoughts and views. The Vinaya notes that should a person handle alcohol, one will be reborn without hands for 500 lifetimes. How can such a serious punishment exist? Which eminent master established this precept? This person did not understand the original intents of the Buddha and chronicled such a deviant saying due to improper understanding and lack of common sense. Moreover, on the issue of the ten Sramanera precepts, research should be conducted on how many Buddhist elders truly uphold them. These precepts cannot even be fully upheld by senior monks. How can we expect newly tonsured Sramaneras to uphold them? Is this not nonsensical? On the term the eight Garudamas. From my understanding, the Buddha promoted equality, as can be seen in the saying. When beings of the four castes leave the householder's life, they all together join the Sakya clan. So, how can there be eight Garudamas that promote gender inequality? Which eminent master established these precepts? and makes people uphold them in the name of the Buddha. In Buddhism, taking refuge shows the spirit of democracy and upholding the five precepts signifies freedom. The Buddha advocated equality among the four groups of disciples. Why not combine the wonderful Dharma with today's universal values of freedom, democracy, and equality. In the Buddhist sphere of today, numerous people claim this or that are the words of the Buddha. However, were they truly spoken by the Buddha? On the contrary, how can we claim that this and that were not spoken by the Buddha? Whatever the Buddha did say and do, we will practice it as the Dharma teaching. We now advise others to practice as the Buddha did, to learn from the Buddha, to be a Buddha, to believe that I am a Buddha. However, we must be careful not to wrong the Buddha and use his name to instruct while still clinging to our attachments and deviant views. Such actions shall bring serious consequences. Today's Buddhists have become volunteers for Buddhism. They offer to protect their faith. They embrace Buddhism. But what has Buddhism given to these devotees in return? Once, when I was presiding over a taking refuge and five precept ceremony, a devotee refused to take the precepts out of fear of taking the precept of no lying. It was because he had heard about the story of a Chan master who was reborn as a fox for 500 lifetimes for having claimed that great practitioners are not subjected to karma when he had meant that they too were subjected to karma. This devotee was terrified that he might lie. I believe that when other Buddhists hear of this reason, they would dissuade him from taking the precepts. Instead of worrying about lying, one can choose to practice right speech. Once, there was a Buddhist who owned a textile store, and when customers wanted to buy a piece of cloth, they would ask, How much for a foot of fabric? 
$5. Does the color fade? To sell the cloth, he would lie and say, No, it doesn't. Later, I told him not to respond that way. Instead, I suggested that he could say, The $5 fabric fades easily, but the $8 one does not. Due to the honorable reputation he gained from being honest, his business boomed, which allowed him to build an establishment. Dharma brings goodness to all. My only concern is, why do people not positively explain Buddhism so devotees can receive the benefit of the Dharma? Buddha Dharma, pure and simple, is a series of nearly 300 topics that address my understanding of the subjects that I encounter daily. The problems confronted by Buddhism lie deeper. I just hope there are determined people who will reassess Buddhism as a whole and return to Buddhism its original meaning so that the true teachings of the Buddha can pervade in this world. Certainly, as Buddhism spread, it has evolved according to the cultures, languages, traditions, people, and climates of different geographical regions. Thus, skillful means required to enhance the process of dissemination have certainly become a matter of fact. In Chinese Buddhism, only succeeding generations of Chan masters still possessed some right view and understood some of the Dharma. Few people continue to research and propagate the true Dharma that other schools taught. For example, dependent origination and the middle path as taught by the three treaties school. As the saying goes, deviant faiths arise when right faith declines. I intend for this book to be a catalyst for all to think outside the box. Should any ideas presented in this book sound incomplete, I sincerely apologize. My humble hope is only that it mirrors the intentions of the Buddha so that all may reassess the true meaning of the Buddha Dharma. I am grateful and humble to accept any understanding and comments that reflect my intentions. May 2016, Founders Quarters, for Guanchan. End of preface. Chapter 1 Faith Religious faith is regarded by the Chinese as a way of receiving blessings through prayer. Most Buddhists, too, also fail to comprehend that true religious faith is built upon selfless compassion and detachment from form. Most do not realize that religious faith is based on right view, honesty, righteousness, and a selfless dedication to helping others. Speaking of faith, people often advocate the belief of having a good heart is enough and there is no need for religious faith. However, why would any good heart reject religious faith? There are also people who take pride in being a religious and say, I don't believe in any religion. I have no faith. However, when faced with adversity, such as a business failure, a disappointing relationship, an existential crisis, or when tormented by pain and sickness, people naturally seek religious support. In particular, 
when a death in the family occurs, people often still reach out to a monastic to preside over the funeral. Thus, it can be said that the issues of life and death are not separate from religious faith. Sima Zhongyuan, the renowned writer, once described himself during a public lecture as a Buddhist at heart, despite being Catholic. He said that in China, Buddhism is in everyone's hearts, regardless of their religious beliefs. With the custom of chanting Amitabha Buddha's name, or praying to Guanyin Bodhisattva in times of sickness and adversity handed down for thousands of years, it can be said that Buddhist faith is an inherent part of Chinese culture. In fact, it matters not to the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas whether one believes in them or not. To them, they gain and lose nothing. However, it would be a true pity if a person lacks faith in themselves. Self-doubt in one's ability, knowledge, and understanding all arise from a lack of self-belief. A person who has faith in themselves is capable of committing wholesome deeds and has the strength to help others. Moreover, they are able to discern the wholesome from unwholesome and believe in their own capability and potential. Would that not be a meaningful life? Certainly, the levels of faith can be likened to a school system that includes primary school, secondary school, and university. Just as students complete their grade levels sequentially, faith has its own increments, beginning with a basic understanding and gradually progressing with each step. Regarding the different levels of faith, I once said, No faith is better than wrong faith. Blind faith is better than no faith. And right faith is better than blind faith. The basis of any religion should be established upon right faith that allows us to reap immeasurable benefits. Not only should one develop right faith, one should also believe in a religion that allows one the freedom to do so. Particularly, it is best for everyone to have confidence and faith in themselves. Buddhism teaches that the most important faith is faith in oneself. To believe in one's potential to attain Buddhahood and to be a good person. As such, is it not important to have faith in oneself? Faith is like an ocean. Would it not be wonderful to have a heart as boundless as the ocean? Faith is like treasures deep in the mountains. Is it not so that the beautiful virtues of wisdom, repentance, benevolence and righteousness that lie in one's heart also happen to represent faith? No matter who you are, do admit that you too have faith. Only with faith can life be whole and complete. Only with faith can spirituality and goals be sought. It is only through faith that transcendence and a greater self be found. Only in this way can one succeed in the future. End of chapter 1チャプター 2 Thus have I heard Thus have I heard is a phrase found at the beginning of almost every Buddhist sutra This phrase originated from a question asked by Ananda to the Buddha during the final moments before parinirvana 
how do we inspire faith in those who read your sutras in the future? In reply, the Buddha instructed Ananda to begin each teaching in writing with, Thus have I heard, to mean, This is what I, Ananda, have heard the Buddha say in person, which is now put in writing exactly as it is. Thus have I heard enabled the Buddha's canon to be passed down to posterity in the forms of the Tripitaka and the Twelve Divisions. As the saying goes, the essence of this true teaching is purely conveyed in voice and hearing. Anyone wishing to attain samadhi shall do so by truly hearing that voice. It must be known that the purpose of the Dharma is served by means of spoken voice. While there are many ways of practice in Buddhism, the only means for the Dharma to root deeply in the mind is by receiving the Buddha's teachings through one's hearing faculties. In particular, Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva perceives the suffering of living beings by first hearing their cries for help and then reaching out to them no matter where they are. This is how Avalokiteshvara answers to all cries from all places and offers deliverance. Some may also wonder why it is not Thus have I seen. The reason is that hearing plays a more profound role than seeing. For example, what has happened in the past cannot be seen by eye again, but it can be recounted by memory. An incident from afar may not be seen by the eye, but I can encounter it by hearing the sounds or watching it over a broadcast. On another account, although two people separated by a wall cannot see each other, they can still hear each other. Eyes see, ears listen. Each sense organ has its own function, but the hearing faculty is much more powerful than that of the eye. That is why, thus have I heard, is used in the sutras instead of, thus I have seen. Buddhist practice emphasizes deepened impression through accumulated hearing. Moreover, as writings of the Buddha's teachings begin with, thus have I heard, one should strive to listen mindfully, skillfully, and attentively. In Buddhism, practitioners who wish to cultivate should enter samadhi through listening, contemplating, and practicing. This means contemplating and reflecting on what was heard as a whole and through a positive context, as well as putting it into practice. When all aspects of listening, contemplation, and practice are fulfilled, one is able to realize and awaken to the way. In other words, reach samadhi. As such, thus have I heard, was interpreted as only listening to the words of a sutra. Now it means listening to the Dharma. It also encompasses the meaning of respect, making an offering, reflecting on the teachings, and putting into practice what one has heard. Therefore, the spirit of thus have I heard, can only be realized when one also believes in, accepts, and upholds the Dharma. End of chapter 2。Chapter 3 Listen Mindfully 
There is a saying in Buddhism, the Dharma is purely conveyed in voice and hearing. For this reason, sutras always begin with, thus have I heard. Buddhists today often talk about going somewhere to listen to the Dharma. Rarely do they say that they are going somewhere to transcribe a sutra or to read a sutra. Of course, transcribing and reading sutras are also ways of practice, but they are not as common as listening to the Dharma. In the Diamond Sutra, after Subhuti requested the Buddha to expound the Dharma, the Buddha replied, I will now answer your question. Listen mindfully. Listen mindfully. Listening mindfully means to listen intently and attentively, as well as to reflect upon and remember. Other than listening mindfully, one must also learn to listen fully, listen to all aspects, and listen skillfully. Listening fully means not taking the meaning of what was spoken out of context. Listening to all aspects is to hear from all perspectives and not to be biased. Listening skillfully refers to thinking positively after listening. That is why it is recorded in the sutras that one enters samadhi only through listening, contemplation, and practice. A person who does not pay attention when others are talking is like a faulty printer that produces blurry texts and images, or even one that fails to print. It is also like a seed planted on infertile land or strewn on the road. No matter how good the seed, it will not be able to grow. Therefore, do not listen partially when hearing the Dharma. Neither be attached to the concepts, nor deliberately misinterpret them. These are all actions that defeat the purpose of the Dharma. One must have true faith in the Buddha's teachings. Dharma talks should be attended frequently and listened to most mindfully. However, most people today fail to understand the importance of listening mindfully. Like students who do not pay attention in class, how can the Dharma flow into their hearts? How can they answer when tested? Students who listen will know how to answer a test. Devotees who listen mindfully will find it easier to understand and connect with the truth. Many discussions could be brought up about the attitudes of devotees when they listen to the Dharma. Today, when one is asked, where did you go? They would answer, I went to a Dharma talk. What was the talk about? Oh, I wasn't very attentive. I can't recall. Not remembering indicates that the Dharma did not take root in the mind. If the Dharma does not take root, then it will not grow. It does not matter how much Dharma you listen to, all would be in vain. For this reason, Buddhist practitioners should not just practice on a superficial level. One should earnestly and sincerely listen to the Dharma when opportunities arise. Only then will fruitful results be yielded. End of chapter 3「Four: Listening, Contemplation and Practice In today's fast-paced world, people like things done quickly. We travel on high-speed trains and fly on high-speed planes. The faster a computer or mobile phone, the better. Speed is indeed important. However, in many situations, haste makes waste. 
For instance, academic achievement takes time and effort to accomplish. As per the Chinese sayings, it takes 10 years to polish a sword, and it takes 10 years of perseverance to achieve academic success. It is also recorded in the sutras that the Buddha spent 21 days in deep meditative contemplation, reflecting on the truth he discovered upon attaining awakening. This illustrates that the process of learning requires careful consideration in order to be fulfilled. Nothing would be achieved if speed becomes priority. Particularly, Thinking cannot develop in an instant. One must take one step at a time and wait for the right conditions to arise. Only by accumulated hearing can the impressions of Dharma be deepened. Added with right understanding and solid practice, mastery can then be accomplished. Once mastery in thinking is attained, awakening thereby arises and thus the state of Samadhi is realized. Gold ore from the mine needs to be refined before it can become ornaments that adorn the world. A newly sown seed needs to grow leaves and stems before it can bloom and bear fruit to benefit people. Listening is like mining gold and sowing a seed. Contemplation is the refinement of gold and a sprout growing leaves. Practice is the product, like fine gold jewelry and lush trees with abundant fruits. By this, it can be seen that listening, contemplation, and practice of the Dharma are inseparable, each complementing the other. A good listener not only listens mindfully and skillfully, but also listens to the sound of one hand clapping and the sound of silence. Thus is able to listen to the mind. In a broader sense, the meaning of listening also includes reading. To not only be well read in all subjects and Buddhist sutras, but more importantly, read to be a better person. Read to understand reasons. Read to see causes and conditions. And read to understand the heart. Reading should be lively. We must be able to apply what was read to everyday living instead of being just a simple bookworm. After listening and contemplation, repeated reflection needs to be applied to understand what was heard. Only then will one internalize the teaching and benefit from the teaching. Otherwise, even the most learned person will retain nothing, just as footprints on the beach are easily washed away by the tide. Therefore, when teaching, the Buddha always instructed his disciples, listen mindfully, listen mindfully, contemplate deeply. Listening mindfully is only the first step. The second step is to contemplate deeply. To prevent misunderstanding and misinterpretation of the teachings, one needs to reflect correctly, skillfully, purely and comprehensively. Only then will one have a correct understanding and right view. While one may find it easy to understand a teaching, putting it into practice will be the challenge. Without putting one's understanding into practice to achieve true attainments, even the best teachings will be futile. For this reason, listening and contemplation of the Dharma must be followed by practice in order for self-realization, self-awakening, and the task of benefiting sentient beings to be possible. 
For instance, after listening to teachings on loving kindness and compassion, these virtues need to be actualized in one's life through developing what is virtuous and beautiful. After learning about meditative concentration, it should be applied through self-reflection and the way one treats others. Upon learning from the wisdom of others, one should apply that knowledge to practice the Buddha's way and benefit all beings. Loving kindness, compassion, patience and prajna wisdom are all important virtues. Therefore, insights gained from listening and contemplation should be practiced and delivered to the world so that everyone may benefit. Apply what has been heard and contemplated to inspire others to realize the profundity of life and the universe. The Buddha spent 49 years expounding the Dharma in over 300 occasions, delivering sentient beings. In this way, he perfected his attainment of Samadhi through listening, contemplation, and practice. With adequate applications of Dharma through listening, contemplation, and practice, how can wisdom not arise? Listen, contemplate, and practice the Dharma to realize that the self, all Dharma realms, and sentient beings are one. What more is there to ask for? End of chapter 4「Taking Refuge in the Triple Gem」The Triple Gem, Buddha, Dharma and Sangha, is the core of Buddhist faith, a spiritual wealth that transcends all worldly wealth. The Buddha is the founder, Dharma is the truth, and Sangha is the teacher. All three are important conditions for sentient beings to attain liberation. Parables in the sutras refer to the Buddha as a good doctor, the Dharma as the wondrous cure, and Sangha as the carers. Only by having all three can a patient be healed. Likewise, in life, only by relying on the power of the triple gem can one be free from suffering and obtain happiness. Only then can one be at perfect ease and find liberation. The Buddha is like the light that nurtures all beings. Light shines, warms, and allows life to mature. Light drives away darkness and fear. Sunlight brings warmth and allows plants to grow. Similarly, the Buddha's light illuminates the mind. Taking refuge in the Buddha is like building a power station in one's mind that continuously generates wholesome qualities of loving-kindness, wisdom, and faith. The Dharma is like the water that nourishes all beings. Water cleanses, eradicating defilements and karmic hindrances. Water quenches thirst and allows plants to thrive, thus enabling one's well-being and growth. Taking refuge in the Dharma is like building waterworks in one's mind that nourishes the body and mind, cleansing away afflictions and defilements. The Sangha is like a field, enabling the planting of merit and virtue. The Sangha is a teacher and a wholesome friend. For example, Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva, Maitreya Bodhisattva, Siddhigarbha Bodhisattva and eminent masters are all teachers who educate, instruct and pass down knowledge. The Sangha serves and offers all beings convenience. Taking refuge in the Sangha 
is like owning many fields over which crops can grow into bountiful harvests and buildings can be constructed to enhance urban development. While worldly treasures make life more comfortable, the Triple Gem is a spiritual treasure that brings peace, happiness, liberation, and ease. It can be likened to how an elderly person finds support from a walking stick, or how children find safety through calling out to their parents for safety from danger. Similarly, one finds safety from adversity through the power of contemplating the Triple Gem even when not in their presence. Simply being mindful of them brings power to the mind. To truly take refuge in the Triple Gem, one begins with taking refuge in the original Triple Gem, then advances to the abiding Triple Gem, and lastly, takes refuge in the intrinsic Triple Gem. The Buddha said that all beings possess the Buddha nature. By taking refuge in the Triple Gem, one takes refuge in oneself. As said in the sutras, the mind, the Buddha, and all sentient beings are all one and the same. Therefore, one must be respectful and have faith in the Triple Gem to reap the benefits. Although taking refuge in the Triple Gem does not constrain one to the precepts, a sense of faith is itself a precept. Faith represents one's mind and character, which should never be infringed upon. Taking refuge in the Triple Gem is not only about recognizing a master, but to have faith in oneself and to take refuge in one's intrinsic nature. It is to practice self-discipline and self-respect through following the Buddha's teachings on basic human morality and to uphold fundamental values of ethics. This can be done by practicing right action, right speech, and right mindfulness as well as the three acts of goodness, do good deeds, speak good words, and think good thoughts. In this way, one's physical, verbal, and mental karma is purified. Such is the true meaning of taking refuge in the Triple Gem. End of chapter 5「Chapter 6 – Upholding the Five Precepts」Despite different opinions on the teachings of the Buddha, every school and sect of Buddhism adheres strictly to the precepts as laid down by the Buddha. A Buddhist observing the precepts is like a student following school rules, or a citizen abiding by the law. The only difference is that school rules and a nation's laws are externally enforced rules, while Buddhist precepts are inner values of self-discipline. Taking refuge is the first step to learning Buddhism, while upholding the five precepts is faith in practice. The essence of precepts is not to infringe upon others. By doing so, one's three karmas physical, verbal, and mental karma, can be purified. Therefore, precepts are the foundation of all wholesome practices. Upholding the five precepts enhances one's faith and wisdom, gives rise to merit, and strengthens one's practice. This strength prevents unwholesome conduct and wrongdoing from arising. One will also be respected by others and coexists in harmony with all. The five precepts are Number one, refrain from killing. This mainly refers to not violating human life and respecting people's right to life. 
Though Buddhism does not enforce a vegetarian diet, one should not kill other beings carelessly. As the saying goes, you are urged not to shoot the spring birds, for the nesting babies await their mother's return. Therefore, to refrain from killing is to not violate or harm lives, and to evolve from advocating human rights to the rights to life. Number two, refrain from stealing. This refers to not illegally taking possession of others' properties, namely, taking without permission. The property of others should be respected. Taking things without permission, instructing someone else to do so, or delighting upon seeing such action are all considered inappropriate. Furthermore, opportunism, corruption, embezzlement, misusing public funds, operating illegal businesses, or fraud are considered unacceptable illegal proceeds in Buddhism. Number three, refrain from sexual misconduct. This refers to refraining from being involved in extramarital relationships, which bring misfortune to families and upset the order of society. Therefore, refraining from sexual misconduct means respecting the body, reputation, and integrity of others. Not only will families be happy, societies and nations shall also be stable and harmonious. Number four, refrain from lying. This refers to refraining from harsh, divisive, flattering, or dishonest speech. Gossip and slander that damage another's reputation, sabotage the good intentions of others, or result in grave harm are considered lying. Therefore, refraining from lying means respecting the reputation and credibility of other people. Number five, refrain from intoxicants. As a general rule, this refers to not partaking substances that harm one's health or impair one's judgment. For example, drugs like morphine not only harm the body and mind, it also corrodes one's reputation, wealth, and affinities with others. Alcohol is a stimulant that poisons the body and mind when taken in excess. Therefore, to refrain from intoxicants is to respect the health and intelligence of oneself and others. The five precepts may seem like five separate aspects, but fundamentally speaking, there is only one core precept, to not violate others. Personal freedom is gained by respecting others and refraining from infringing upon them. Upholding the five precepts embodies the true meaning of freedom and democracy. The majority of those imprisoned and deprived of their freedom are all those who have violated the five precepts. Therefore, to uphold the five precepts is to abide by the law. Only those who uphold the five precepts can be free from fear and worry, enabling a life truly of freedom, peace, happiness, and dignity. Among Buddhists, the general practice of giving is a means of accumulating merits. This is a way of benefiting others through material giving. Anyone willing to give can do so. On the other hand, upholding the five precepts is a practice to prevent wrongdoings and ensure wholesome deeds that lead to the purification of oneself. Such practice inspires respect for others and brings a sense of inner peace and stability to society so that freedom can be enjoyed by all. The merit gained from not violating others surpasses that of the practice of generosity. That is why 
the Buddha highly regarded the five precepts as the five mahadanas, or the five great offerings. Moreover, the five precepts in Buddhism, refraining from killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, lying, and intoxicants, share something in common with the five constant virtues of Confucianism, humaneness, righteousness, propriety, wisdom, and integrity. To refrain from killing is humaneness. To refrain from stealing is righteousness. To refrain from having sexual misconduct is propriety. To refrain from lying is integrity. And to refrain from intoxicants is wisdom. However, the difference between the two is that the five constant virtues are meant to exhort others and restrict oneself, whereas the five precepts are a progression from a passive practice of non-infringement to actively respecting and benefiting others. The fundamental spirit of the precepts is to respect the freedom of others and to not infringe upon anyone. In this way, those who protect lives and refrain from killing will naturally be healthy and long-lived. Those who give and refrain from stealing will naturally be wealthy. Those who respect the integrity of others and refrain from sexual misconduct will naturally have harmonious families. Those who praise others and refrain from lying will naturally have a good reputation. Those who avoid alcohol and intoxicants will naturally be healthy. From the perspective of benefiting oneself, upholding the five precepts is like sowing seeds in a field of merit. One is naturally benefited even without prayer, thus enjoying endless merit and wholesome effects. In the context of benefiting others, Upholding the five precepts is the cure that purifies people's minds. The more people uphold the precepts, the more benefits they will bring. If everyone in a nation upholds the five precepts, then the nation will certainly be a harmonious, joyous, free, and democratic land. End of chapter 6Chapter 7. Understanding Precepts There is a saying in Buddhism. When precepts prevail, the Sangha will prevail. When the Sangha prevails, the Dharma will prevail. The Buddha originally established precepts to maintain harmony and purity within the Sangha so that righteous Dharma will prevail in this world. Therefore, precepts are the cornerstones of the Sangha. However, upholding the precepts is not exclusive to monastics. Precepts are needed to regulate oneself, for they are the fundamentals of all wholesome dharmas. Only then will one's path in life be secure. The purpose of precepts is not of discussion, but of practice. Moreover, one should be flexible in applying the precepts instead of rigid adherence. According to Mahayana Buddhism, there are three categories of pure precepts. Number one, precepts of rites, which teaches how to walk, stand, sit, and lie down with proper conduct. Number two, precepts of virtues, which teaches that all actions should be rooted in loving-kindness and compassion. Number three, precepts to benefit sentient beings, which teaches to actively care for the benefit of all sentient beings. These are functional ways of upholding precepts. There is a Buddhist record 
about King Prasenajit of ancient India and his wife, Queen Malika. The king and queen shared a loving relationship, but ever since the queen took refuge in Buddhism and upheld the five precepts, she strictly observed the precepts of refraining from killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, lying, and consuming alcohol. Returning from a conquest, the king was so dissatisfied with the food prepared for him that he furiously ordered the royal cook to be executed. When Queen Malika heard this, she pondered on how to save the cook. An idea arose in the queen's mind and she went to King Prasenajit. Oh, great king, I'm so happy that you came home. Today, I'm going to arrange a welcoming banquet in your honor and drink with you. King Prasenajit was most happy when he heard this, but also suspicious. Aren't you observing the precepts? He asked Queen Malika. Queen Malika replied, Today is an exception, for this is a welcome banquet for you. But, my king, I have one request. Good wine needs good food. I hope that the royal chef can make some of my favorite dishes today. Upon hearing this, the king thought, Oh no, I have ordered the execution of the royal cook. He immediately shouted to his subjects, Spare his life! Spare his life! The cook was thus released from the place of execution. The question here is, did Queen Malika break the precepts with her actions? Precepts depend on the intention, instead of rigidly adhering to written clauses. If improper acts were committed out of greed, hatred, and ignorance, then one would have broken the precepts. On the other hand, if the precepts are broken to save others and the world, then one cannot, in an ordinary manner, regard this as breaking the precepts. A similar incident happened in mainland China. At the end of the Ming Dynasty, Zhang Jianzong started a rebellion, and some of the bandits under his banner broke into a monastery. Besides monastics, many commoners sought protection within the monastery. Venerable Po Shan, the abbot of the monastery, wanted to protect everyone, so he stepped forward and asked the bandits not to harm anyone. Knowing that Venerable Po Shan faithfully upheld the precepts, the bandits deliberately made things difficult for him and brought a bowl of meat before the abbot. Very well, great abbot. If you eat this bowl of meat, we will not kill them. If you don't, no one will be spared. Immediately, Venerable Po Shan took up the bowl of meat and finished it. The bandits kept their word and spared everyone. So, the question here is, did Venerable Po Shan violate or uphold the precepts? If we intend to save the people and the world, then that would be the Bodhisattva precept of benefiting all sentient beings, as well as the inherent precept fundamental to bhikkhus. Upholding precepts does not mean adhering strictly to the form of the precepts. Instead, one must apply the essence of precepts pragmatically. The emphasis on precepts should be on upholding and practicing them, and Buddhists should have this right understanding of precepts. However, if one were to steal for somebody who threatened one's life, or agree to violate the precepts for someone who threatened to commit suicide if one does not requite romantic gestures, these one-on-one -on -one actions are selfish and unreasonable, and complying with them would violate the precepts. Precepts instruct to uphold all wholesome actions. 
if one can love and care for others and society, and be willing to dedicate and sacrifice for the sake of the people, then one would not be violating the precepts, even when cutting off one's flesh to feed an eagle, or giving up one's body to feed a tiger. End of chapter 7「Upon enlightenment, the Buddha awakened to the principle of dependent origination. Worried that the concept was too profound and difficult to comprehend, the Buddha was hesitant about propagating this truth, not wanting to frighten sentient beings, yet still for them to give rise to faith. As a result, during the first turning of the Dharma wheel in Sarnath, the Buddha chose to teach the Four Noble Truths to the five bhikkhus instead. First, suffering. Second, cause. Third, cessation. And fourth, the path. The Four Noble Truths can be equated to an outline of the Dharma detailing the cultivational sequence enabling people to cross from this shore of fixations on suffering, emptiness, and impermanence to the other shore of true permanence, bliss, self, and purity. The first two of the noble truths, suffering and cause, describe the worldly causes and effects of a delusive world and the aspect of transmigration. The truth of cause represents the cause, while the truth of suffering represents the effect. The last two of the noble truths, cessation and path, describe transcendental causes and effects of an awakened world, that is, the aspect of nirvana. The truth of the path represents the cause, and the truth of cessation represents the effect. If explained in the logical order of cause and effect, the sequence of the Four Noble Truths is first, cause, second, suffering, third, path, and fourth, cessation. However, to sentient beings, the effect tends to have a more apparent relevance to them than the cause. Using skillful means, the Buddha therefore first explained the truth of suffering, so all beings may lessen their attachment to worldly affairs. He then explained the truth of cause, the karmic causes of suffering, so people would be inspired to cease it. Next, the Buddha explained the truth of cessation, the joyous truth of nirvana, to inspire the cessation of suffering. Lastly, he explained the truth of the path, the practice of ceasing suffering, so it could be upheld. The goal of the Buddha's teachings is to enable all beings to understand suffering, cease its causes, aspire for nirvana, and to practice its path. The Four Noble Truths is like the process of treating an illness. The truth of suffering describes the painful experience of being ill. The truth of cause is the diagnosis of its symptoms. The truth of the path is the prescription for cure. And the truth of cessation is the experience of full recovery from the illness. Physical ailments require medical treatments to be cured. Mental afflictions require the Dharma to be treated. The cure is the Noble Eightfold Path. Right view, right thought, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. 
afflictions are ceased through upholding the Noble Eightfold Path, thus liberating one from the suffering of samsara. Right view refers to having the correct understanding and proper faith, as well as the judgment to recognize right from wrong, wholesome from unwholesome, and true from false. Such judgment leads to proper conduct, the key feature of the Noble Eightfold Path. Right thought is proper thinking free from greed, hatred, and ignorance. It is the practice of avoiding erroneous and delusional thoughts through the contemplation and understanding of wisdom. Right speech is to speak compassionately with loving kindness, which in return gives rise to faith and joy in others. Right action and right livelihood include the daily actions of upholding the five precepts, abiding by morality and ethics, and not selfishly infringing upon others. Right effort and right mindfulness are preventing all that is unwholesome and doing all that is wholesome, such as giving to others and helping the needy. Right concentration is to remain calm in the face of adversity, using wisdom to discern and resolve a situation. In Buddhism, the four great bodhisattvas have resolved suffering and cause. At the same time, they have accomplished cessation and the path. Out of loving kindness and compassion, Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva travels the land in various manifestations. Seeing living beings suffer from the three poisons or seven calamities, the Bodhisattva listens to their cries for help and alleviates their suffering. Such is the practice of the great vow. Sentient beings are limitless. I vow to liberate them. By the power of great vows, Sitigarbha Bodhisattva aspires to liberate all beings in hell. The Bodhisattva rescues beings in hell who suffer from the cause of greed, hatred, ignorance, and arrogance thereby illuminating the depths of hell with the Buddha's light. Such is the practice of the vow. Afflictions are endless. I vow to eradicate them. With great wisdom and inconceivable merit, Manjusri Bodhisattva leads people from ignorance to awakening, from suffering to joy, using skillful means and knowledge. Such is the practice of the vow. Teachings are infinite. I vow to learn them. Through the power of practice, Samantabhadra Bodhisattva encourages the cultivation of respecting one another, praising the virtues of others, and offering joy with a sense of remorse and humility. In this way, the Bodhisattva combines myriad practices into the creation of a pure land, ensuring the liberation of all beings in suffering. Such is the practice of the vow. Buddhahood is supreme. I vow to attain it. Ultimately, the Dharma does not merely explain the phenomena of the universe and the human condition through the truths of suffering, cause, cessation, and the path the Dharma seeks to resolve them. Therefore, vows, cultivation and actualization are integral. The Four Noble Truths provide the skillful means to liberation as they lead to the development of the Four Universal Vows and the Six Paramitas. Once the Four Noble Truths are thoroughly understood, one still needs to emulate the Bodhisattva spirit in practicing all dharmas. With the Four Noble Truths as a foundation, one completes the Bodhisattva path by actualizing the four means of embracing and the six paramitas 
as practices of cultivation. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 Noble Eightfold Path In Buddhism, all Buddhas attain Buddhahood because of their vows. Making vows is akin to establishing one's resolve. Once a resolution is set, one is motivated to move forward, for there is a goal. Similarly, Buddhism encourages people to make vows because faith requires aspiration and the motivation to reach the established goal. In the past, Buddhist teachings always told people to do good deeds as it brings good karmic rewards. But what are the good deeds to be done, and what results will they reap? Furthermore, what is the reason and objective of doing good deeds? How can people be motivated to do them? These questions have no definitive answers. Moreover, what is the meaning of speaking good words? Which words are considered good, and what are their results? The lack of clear instructions makes it difficult for practitioners to be motivated to actualize the teachings. The goal of Buddhism is liberation, the eradication of affliction and suffering. The Noble Eightfold Path provides a clear guide to achieving this goal where concrete actions can be actualized in practice. The Noble Eightfold Path consists of eight methods leading to a bright future. As the saying goes, all roads lead to Rome. Each of these eight paths leads to liberation. What are these eight paths? Number one. Right view, having the correct understanding and principles. It is like a camera, where the exposure and focal length must first be adjusted to take a clear picture. Number two, right thought, having a mind free from erroneous and delusional thoughts, greed or desires. It allows the contemplation and understanding of truth and wisdom. Number three, right speech, speaking words that are truthful, free from delusions, and speech that is devoid of slander, conceit, impudence, intolerance, flattery, and deception. Number four, right action, abiding in pure and wholesome karma refraining from improper actions, such as killing, stealing, and sexual misconduct. Number five, right livelihood, earning a living and supporting oneself through proper means. Number six, right effort, pursuing the truth with courage and diligence. Number seven, Right Mindfulness, Attentively Contemplating on Wholesome Teachings. Number 8. Right Concentration, Having a Focused Mindset and Spirit through Proper Meditative Practice empowers the unsettled body and mind to concentrate on a singular meditative object. Practicing the Noble Eightfold Path prevents us from being led astray. Moreover, it not only guarantees freedom from worry in this life, but it also allows the continuation of spiritual cultivation towards Buddhahood life after life. Most practitioners hope to discover their goals in life from their faith, yet they are unsure of how to practice. If Buddhism only teaches people to chant the Buddha's name, 
meditate and to prostrate. It does not provide clear instructions and explanations. The Noble Eightfold Path is a list of eight methods that guide practitioners towards Nirvana. Upholding them will lead one to the ultimate goal of liberation. End of chapter 9。Chapter 10 Impermanence The idea of impermanence is feared by many, as they would assume that it means all worldly matters are transient and unreal. For instance, wealth and relationships can be impermanent. One cannot really possess anything in this world, as it is constantly changing. Therefore, impermanence is usually viewed as negative, pessimistic, and nonsensical. However, impermanence should not be explained in this way. When viewed differently. Impermanence can be full of positivity and optimism. During the Stone Age, humans were primitive and uncivilized. Without impermanence, we would still be cavemen. In feudal times, people lacked freedom under the rule of absolute monarchy. If things remained unchanged without impermanence, how would there be democracy today? When natural disasters, such as earthquakes and typhoons, strike, buildings would collapse and people get hurt or die. However, since everything in this world is impermanent, it means we have the chance to rebuild our homes. Many buildings and schools that have been rebuilt from natural disasters do become better. Newer, more complete, and well equipped than before. Impermanence has both disheartened humanity and also given courage for us to get back on our feet again, because being alive means there is still hope. Had all worldly matters remained eternally unchanging, then the world would be lifeless and still. It must be known that all phenomena arise due to causes and conditions. When conditions are present, they arise. When conditions disperse, they cease to exist. For this reason, life can be constantly renewed and lively. For this reason, hope can be found in despair. Impermanence causes. The arising and cessation of all phenomena. For example, flowers bloom and wilt, the sun rises and sets, and the moon waxes and wanes. The coming and going of the four seasons, and the start and end of day and night, are examples of how impermanence makes the world different. Because of impermanence. There is a diversity and beauty in nature. Because of impermanence, we are motivated to strive harder. Therefore, impermanence should not be feared, but something to be grateful for, as it widens our horizon, elevates our life perspectives, and enables the development of our career and undertakings. As such. If viewed negatively, impermanence means something good will turn bad. However, when viewed positively, impermanence is what enables us to change for the better. For instance, if a poor person strives forward and broadly develops good affinities, he will become wealthier. If a slow learner studies diligently. He will become smarter. Had there not been impermanence, 
people would be forever trapped in poverty and ignorance. Since life is variable, as long as we continue to correct and improve our behavior and keep striving forward, our life and future will naturally improve. For this reason, impermanence teaches us to cherish our blessings and opportunities. Impermanence teaches us to cherish our relationships. For this reason, we should be grateful for impermanence. Taking a step further, life is like an investment. A proper amount of effort must be invested in order to bring forth changes to our life and to take matters into our own hands. Impermanence is a perpetual truth. When experienced, learn to think positively and act courageously to change, so that we can always transcend and improve. There is no need to fear impermanence. Fear only the inability to understand impermanence and life's close connections. Therefore, know that the contemplation of impermanence in Buddhism brings joyful anticipation and endless hope. End of chapter 10. Chapter 11. Suffering. Ever since I became a monastic at a young age, I would always hear people say that life is hard, life is the sea of suffering, or life is full of adversity. In Buddhism, the notion of suffering can be divided into different types. The two sufferings, three sufferings, four sufferings, eight sufferings, and immeasurable suffering. This means that even though life may seem happy, the perception of happiness will still decay. I strongly disagreed with such perspectives. Is suffering the only reason that people wanted to learn about Buddhism? Why would people come for suffering? Traditional Buddhists assert that the meaning of life is nothing but suffering, so one practices to eradicate suffering along with karmic obstructions. As a result, Buddhists tend to overemphasize the practice of austerities, causing daily life to be nothing but misery caused by both mental and physical suffering. In my opinion, suffering cannot be explained solely from a negative perspective. Suffering also has a positive impact on people's lives. Personal growth comes from experiencing suffering. Otherwise, how can one become the best of the best without going through the worst of the worst? Without suffering and hardship, how can there be success? In fact, suffering and happiness are the same in essence. Yet, how can suffering be transformed into happiness? Understanding suffering allows one to transcend and overcome it, and thus work towards peace and happiness. Happiness comes from the experience of suffering. For example, a plentiful harvest comes only through toiling in the fields. Gold needs to be painstakingly panned from a river. Business profits, salaries and wages are earned through hard work. Without suffering, how could there be wealth and happiness? In this world, nothing can be gained without going through some degree of pain. Put differently, suffering is a form of education. For instance, children find studying to be a form of suffering, but such training is what develops knowledge. Children find chores troublesome, but it helps them foster diligence and determination 
which will develop into beneficial lifetime habits. Suffering is a form of strength. The more a person can withstand hardship, the greater the happiness they will find. It can be likened to lifting weights. Some people find even 20 or 30 kilograms too heavy, yet there are others who can easily lift 50 or even 100 kilograms. As such, life is a different experience for those unafraid to face suffering. Suffering is a kind of sustenance. Without the trials of natural disasters, people would not know how to adapt to the changes in the environment. Without man-made calamity, people would not know how to prepare for adversity. Thus, suffering is essential in life. Suffering is a type of training. Many Buddhist practitioners purposely undergo austerities using suffering to train themselves. Likewise, without training strenuously, how can athletes win gold at the Olympic Games? Hunger and cold can be suffering. Being mistreated, blamed and wrongfully accused are also suffering. Having the strength to bear these kinds of suffering allows one to prevail over and transcend them. In other words, by knowing what suffering is and wanting to end suffering, the strength and methods to alleviate it must then be found. The notion that life is suffering must be changed, as it can heavily impact our success in life. Once there was an old lady who always cried. When asked by a monastic why she was always crying, she replied, You wouldn't understand. I have two daughters. The oldest is married to an umbrella maker, and the youngest is married to a noodle maker. On sunny days, all I think about is how hard life must be for my eldest daughter, since no one buys umbrellas. And when it rains, all I think about is my youngest daughter who won't be able to dry noodles under the sun and sell them. I cry for them. Madam, don't think that way. You can change your perspective on things, said the monastic. I can? How? From now on, whenever it's raining, don't think of your youngest daughter. Instead, think of how many umbrellas your eldest is selling. When it's sunny, think of the business your youngest daughter is making through drying and selling lots of noodles. If you change your perspective in this way, so too will your experience of suffering and happiness. Oh, change is possible, said the old lady. In this way, the old lady changed her way of thinking and stopped crying. Instead, she beamed with happiness every day. She was happy for her eldest daughter when it rained and happy for her youngest one when it was sunny. No longer was she known as the crying woman. She was now the smiling woman. I, likewise, would like to change the Buddhist perspective of agonizing over affliction and suffering. Life is short. A person can only experience so many springs and summers in one lifetime. We are not born into this world for suffering. We come into this world for joy and happiness. Suffering is only temporary, not the sum total of life in which joy and happiness are found. Thus, there is no need to fear suffering, for it is a positive factor of life. Those who recoil and retreat in the face of hardship will accomplish little. Only those who are unafraid of suffering and adversity will truly succeed. End of chapter 11。Chapter 12 emptiness. 
While we all live in emptiness, most people do not understand what it means, and instead misbelieve it to be nihilistic, hopeless, and without a future. Therefore, people dislike the idea of emptiness, and sometimes even fear it. However, those who truly understand the Dharma would know that only with emptiness can there be existence. Without emptiness, nothing would come into being. For example, one's pockets need to be empty in order to carry more money in them. Cups and containers need to be empty to be able to contain food and beverage in them. Plots of land need to be empty for houses to be built upon them. Houses need to be empty for people to live inside them. The body's bowels, bladder, stomach, and intestines need to be empty to have space in order for a person to stay alive. Emptiness allows the world to be full of possibilities, for human life to be full of hope, and for the physical body to be fully functional. In everyday life, people squabble over empty space and may even be involved in legal disputes over a few inches of land or a single wall. Yet, they are still fearful of being empty. In actuality, emptiness does not mean nothingness. Rather, it is what makes existence possible. Emptiness is not non-existence. It means to be without, more specifically, to be without measure, without boundaries, without restrictions, or without end. The capacity of emptiness is one without limitations. This ancient Buddhist principle of emptiness has caused much misunderstanding in the Buddhist teachings. Many would mistake the Buddhist teaching as the non-existence of things, such as the sky, earth, human beings, and the self. Hence, people are afraid to learn the Dharma. The truth is, emptiness is the basis of existence. Nothing can come into being without it. Emptiness is an important truth in life. What is it? How can it be understood? Take a table, for example. When asked what it is, most people would say it is a table. But this is incorrect. How so? Is it not clearly a table? In reality, a table is just its nominal form. Its true form can be said to be wood. If the wood was assembled into the shape of a chair, it would no longer be called a table, but a chair instead. Therefore, the table itself is only provisional. Upon examining its origin, one sees that it is actually wood. Now to say it is wood is also incorrect, as this is also a nominal form. What then is its true form? Is it a tree? No, it is the result of a seed planted in soil and nourished by the combination of sunlight, air, water, and fertilizer, which, upon growing into a tree, has been processed into timber and made into a table. As such, the existence of this table arises from dependent origination. Its true form is emptiness. When I write the word emptiness in my one-stroke calligraphy, my disciples would sometimes say, Venerable Master, you should not write about emptiness all the time. People do not like it. To which I would respond, Emptiness is wealth. How can they dislike it? Nowadays, an empty plot of land can cost millions. Emptiness is in fact extremely valuable and prized. I have also composed a couplet 
to further elaborate on the meaning of emptiness. The empty nature of the four elements manifests in existence. The incorporation of the five aggregates is not real either. The four elements refer to earth, water, fire, and wind. Earth supports all beings, allows growth, and provides the necessities of life. Therefore, the earth and the environment must be protected. Likewise, water is vital. Life is impossible without it. Where there is water, there is vegetation, on which animals depend for survival. Similarly, the element of fire is found in sunlight and warmth, allowing the survival and maturation of all things in this world. Lastly, wind refers to air, a breath of it being the difference between life and death. Harmony of the four elements, earth, water, fire and wind, is what allows one to be robust and healthy, so that life can be lived meaningfully. Therefore, it can be said that the four elements are both emptiness and existence. The second line of the couplet refers to the five aggregates of form, feeling, perception, mental formations, and consciousness, the five aspects that constitute the self, body, and mind. This means that a person's existence arises from the combination of causes and conditions. No one is an independent entity. Since existence comes from causes and conditions, it is inherently empty in nature. To say the four elements are empty also means the four elements truly exist. It does not contradict the Buddha's teachings. Why? Does not the combination of the four elements symbolize existence? Existence is emptiness. Emptiness is existence. There is no need to explain emptiness as nothingness as it creates misconceptions and misunderstandings. It is better to comprehend the meaning of emptiness through existence. In the Buddhist teachings, the concept of existence is sometimes mentioned before emptiness is brought up, and at other times, emptiness before existence. Likewise, the concept of non-duality of emptiness and existence is sometimes presented and, at other times, it is, emptiness and existence are one. To say that the four elements are empty is equal to saying the four elements truly exist. Emptiness and existence are like day and night, or two sides of the same coin. The two aspects are of the same essence that is inseparable. End of chapter 12. Chapter 13. Non-Self. The Buddhist concept of non-self tends to arouse fear in people, because they would think it implies that the self, what is most important to them, does not exist. However, is this self real? The question can be answered with a story. Once there was a rich man with four wives. His favorite, the youngest and prettiest, was the fourth. As he neared the end of his life, he wanted his favorite wife to accompany him, for he did not want to die alone. Come with me when I die said the rich man. She turned pale upon hearing this, and said, I am still young and beautiful. Why should I die with you? He then turned to his third wife, who loved him and enjoyed his company. Upon hearing his wish, she replied, To die with you? No. Why not? 
I'm beholden to you for your love and care. Yet, after you die, I can remarry, for I am still young. That is why I cannot die with you. Disappointed, the rich man then went to his second wife. Although I haven't spent much time with you, after all, you are still my wife. Now that I'm dying, you should come with me. No way, said the second wife. I'm the one in charge of the family. After you die, I must arrange your funeral. Don't worry, as your wife, I will participate in the funeral procession and see to the end of your burial. Dejected, the rich man turned to his first wife and asked, Are you willing to die with me? To his surprise, the first wife replied, I am married to you, so indeed I will follow you wherever you go. When you die, of course, I will die with you. It was not until this moment that the rich man realized his first wife was the one who loved him the most. As the saying goes, distance reveals the stamina of a horse, time reveals the true intentions of a person. Likewise, a person's heart and sincerity must withstand the test of time. The first wife represents our mind. As the saying goes, upon death there is nothing you can bring with you. Only karma follows you wherever one goes. When a lifetime ends, the mind is the only thing that follows wherever one goes. The fourth wife represents our most treasured physical body. We adorn our body with cosmetics and nurse it with supplements, but upon death, the physical body cannot come with us. The third wife is still young. She awaits a chance to remarry and wants to pursue her future and destiny. She represents one's riches and valuables. Most people think the more, the better, but none of these can be brought along with us after death. The second wife represents our relatives and friends. They cannot accompany us after death. The most they can do is to help with the funeral arrangements, pay their respects, and send us off to our burial ground. The first wife represents the mind. Upon death, all wholesome and unwholesome karma will follow us into our next rebirth. The Buddhist concept of non-self does not mean that one is non-existent. It means the self is in a constant state of change. Every person changes constantly from moment to moment throughout each lifetime. For example, a woman grows and changes continuously through time, from an infant to a toddler, then to a student, a lady, a mother, and finally to an old lady. Which of these is the actual self? If the answer is none, then what is real and unchanging? One's health and illnesses, as well as happiness and afflictions, are all parts of the changing self. Thus, the self is not an unchanging element, it is the combination of numerous causes and conditions. As conditions arise and cease, which self? The self of yesterday, the self of today, or the self of tomorrow will remain fixed and unchanged. Non-self does not mean there is nothing. Instead, it refers to the ability to accept suffering or happiness, to tolerate abundance or scarcity, to be important or unimportant, to wake up early or stay up late, a self that is omnipotent with infinite possibilities is non-self. There is another side to this self, a true self that exists in the eternal bliss, self and purity of nirvana. Life in this state is eternal, undying, joyful and tranquil. 
Life is undying even if one should wish for death, because what dies is just the physical form. Life is like a river of spring water flowing east. No matter where the water flows, it will eventually return home. This is what is meant by cyclic existence. Spring turns to summer, fall and winter. Fear not the cold of winter, for spring is coming. Likewise, all matter goes through the cycle of formation, existence, decay and emptiness. A building that has decayed and collapsed can be rebuilt over the empty site. It can also be likened to the hands of a clock that travels from 1 to 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. Once it hits 12, the cycle will begin again from 1. Non-self signifies that this self is neither controlled nor created by a god. One has the power to change and correct oneself. Each person chooses what they want to be, be it a doctor, a sculptor, or a painter. Precisely because life is not stuck with an unchangeable self, the future self can be changed through the present. Hence, there are limitless values behind the true meaning of non-self. By understanding non-self, one can eliminate selfishness and self-benefiting acts. By understanding non-self, one can give rise to a transcendental mindset when facing life's problems. End of chapter 13「Chapter 14 – Causes, Conditions and Effects」When Sakyamuni Buddha attained unsurpassed and supreme enlightenment under the Bodhi tree, he was awakened to the truth of the universe and life, dependent origination. Everything in this world is reliant on causes and supported by conditions to give rise to effects. These effects, again, become new causes, and when conditions aggregate, lead to other effects. Therefore, Buddhism believes that everything in this world is composed of causes, conditions, and effects. What are conditions? Before a cause transforms into an effect, conditions are needed. Hence, it is called causes, conditions, and effects. For example, a seed would not grow on a table because the table is not its condition. Seeds need to be planted in fertile soil along with numerous conditions such as sunlight, air, and water before they can grow and bear fruit. Every cause will yield an effect and every effect will give rise to a new cause. Between causes and effects, conditions are essential. A person can be without faith but must still believe in causes, conditions, and effects. Everything in this universe and life relates to one another. Every existence depends on one another for its causes and conditions. In nature, even the tiniest insect needs vegetation for food. Likewise, a person's existence is supported by other people, such as teachers, farmers, laborers, and businessmen who provide life's necessities. Even the human body is made up of the four elements. The realization of the truth of the universe and life comes through understanding causes, conditions, and effects. Consequently, as a human being, 
one should help all beings create good causes and conditions for success, instead of harming others or envying them. Hindering others means that one will not be able to survive either. Because one understands causes, conditions and effects, one realizes that everything in life has its reason for coming about. In this way, one learns self-responsibility. As recorded in the Sutra of Cause and Effect of the Three Time Periods, why is it that one has clothes and food? It results from offering tea and rice to the poor in the past. Why is it that one does not have clothes or food? It results from not even offering half a coin in the past. Why is it that one can wear silk and satin? It results from offering robes to monastics in the past. Why is it that one has dignified features? It results from offering flowers to the Buddhas in the past. In other words, present life experiences are the results of deeds in the past life. Present life deeds will be the cause of future life experiences. Therefore, causes and conditions are not temporary. Instead, they extend through the three time periods. For example, some are born in metropolitan cities, enjoying a civilized life, while others live their whole lives in deserted and desolated areas, struggling with poverty. This is neither an unfair destiny nor controlled by deities, but due to different causes, conditions and effects. If one is willing to work hard, improve, and form good affinities with others, one will gain wholesome results and become successful regardless of birthplace. The principle of causes, conditions, and effects is actually very simple. For example, a man with a small fortune of savings in the bank may do many unwholesome deeds in this life but nobody can stop him from withdrawing his money from his account. On the other hand, a man who has accumulated a lot of past debts may be kind-hearted, but his debts must still be repaid. No one can be exempted from paying their debts due to good reputation and character. Wholesome causes are like saving money. One's merit will increase. Unwholesome causes are like incurring debts. One's merit will be reduced. Karmic rewards and retributions are like a bank account with a clear record of deposits and withdrawals. Unwholesome people have yet to experience retribution for their actions because that time is yet to come. One cannot only observe the happenings of this life or period and presume that cause and effect do not exist. The law of cause and effect has its principles as well. For example, health and wellness have their cause and effect. To be healthy, one needs to maintain a joyful state of body and mind, lead a healthy lifestyle, and exercise. If one prays to the Buddha, for good health while leaving an unhealthy lifestyle and binge eating, then it is as futile as climbing a tree to catch a fish. It does not accord with the truth of cause and effect. To become wealthy, one needs to work hard. To have good affinities with people, one needs to serve others. To earn a good reputation, one needs to cultivate a good and ethical character. Everything in this world has its cause and effect, no matter if it is issues concerning the economy or faith. Buddhism is not an insurance policy. One cannot be confused about cause and effect. Buddhism is not a fatalistic religion. Buddhism believes in a concept of dependent origination. 
Though Buddhism speaks of the causes and effects of the three time periods, the past, present and future, it emphasizes the importance of causes and effects of the present and future. Causes and conditions are inherently empty in nature. From the perspective of the impermanence of all conditioned phenomena and the empty nature of dependent origination, unwholesome causes of the past may have already been created, but one can transform them through hard work and spiritual cultivation in this lifetime. In turn, one develops more wholesome effects for future lives. End of chapter 14. Chapter 15. The Meaning of Cause and Effect. Every phenomenon in this world has a cause and effect relationship. A cause, supported by conditions, will become an effect, and this is a natural law. Most people do not necessarily doubt cause and effect. Rather, they have a misconception of cause and effect. Simply put, one reaps what one sows is the law of cause and effect. However, most people plant melons, but want to reap beans, and want to reap melons having planted beans. With the misconception of cause and effect, one will distort this essential rule. Every action, including spoken words and thoughts, has its cause and effect. Wholesome and unwholesome causes each have their corresponding effects as do right and wrong, emptiness and existence, phenomenon and principle. Thus are the causes, thus are the effects, and this cannot be confused. However, most people believe that being filial to their parents brings wealth, being caring for their children brings honor, praying to the Buddha brings longevity, and being generous brings promotion. These are distorted understandings of cause and effect. Being filial to one's parents is ethical and moral conduct. It has nothing to do with becoming wealthy. Becoming wealthy has its own cause and effect. The causes and effects of wealth are to work hard, initial capital, and the ability to run a business. Being filial to one's parents is the cause of ethical and moral conduct. Furthermore, it is the responsibility of parents to educate and care for their children. One cannot expect to earn an honorable reputation by providing a good education for their children. This does not accord with cause and effect. To earn an honorable reputation and pass on a legacy, one needs to have achievements, such as groundbreaking scientific discoveries, or exemplary services to humanity, society, and the country. In addition, praying to the Buddha is the cause and effect of religious faith. It has nothing to do with longevity. Generosity leads to good affinities, not good health. To be healthy, one needs to exercise eat nutritious food, and fortify one's health. Some may ask, I am a Buddhist. Why am I still involved in a car accident? Commonly, car accidents are caused by speeding or inattention. You cannot blame the Buddha for not blessing you. If everyone demands blessings from the Buddha when they drive, how can the Buddha oversee and bless the billions of people driving daily? Instead, one should rely on oneself for blessings. Such is cause and effect. Therefore, most people have a misconception of cause and effect. Wishing for everything to wilt during spring, 
a season when flowers and plants bloom, does not accord with cause and effect. For spring causes growth, not decay. The wish for flowers to bloom in autumn or winter, that is also against cause and effect. Though winter hardy plants can withstand deep snow and a harsh climate, plants that cannot be nurtured in the cold will live or die according to causes and conditions. What is cause and effect? Plant what one wants to reap. Planting bamboo yields bamboo shoot. Planting peach and pear trees yield peaches and pears. Wheat will not grow from paddy stalks, and soybean will not grow in a wheat field. The principle of cause and effect is easily understood, but people lack a clear understanding. Instead, people muddle the wonderful and easily understood principle of cause and effect, confuse cause from effect, and claim the principle itself is faulty. At times, some people live a splendid life and seemingly escape from heavenly retribution despite having committed crimes and earning their fortune illegally. This is because they still have meritorious causes and conditions accumulated in the past, just like savings in a bank. Once those savings are exhausted, they will naturally face the fruition of their karma. Good fortune rarely lasts more than three to five generations, for the law of cause and effect is quick to strike. There are also pious Buddhists who uphold a vegetarian diet and accomplished many wholesome deeds, such as building bridges and paving roads. However, some of these people are penniless and believe there is no justice or cause and effect in this world. This is also a mistaken mindset. Good effects come to those who do wholesome deeds. However, the bank still demands repayment of past debts. The bank cannot clear one's debts just because of a wholesome deed. Once the debts are paid, wholesome deeds of the past will naturally lead to wholesome effects. In Buddhism, everything has its cause and effect. For example, the economy has its cause and effect. So does morality and ethics, health, and affinities with other people. To reap what is wanted, one must plant accordingly. This logic is plainly explicit. Therefore, the law of cause and effect in Buddhism is explained according to the three time periods not just one. Take plants, for example. Sowing seeds in spring and harvesting in fall is the cause and effect in this life. Planting seeds this year and harvesting next year is the cause and effects of the next life. Planting seeds this year and harvesting many years later is the cause and effect of many lifetimes. The law of cause and effect is clear. As the saying goes, wholesome actions lead to wholesome retribution. Unwholesome actions lead to unwholesome retribution. Say not that there are no retributions. It is only a matter of time. In Buddhism, the law of cause and effect stretches across three time periods. Present life experiences are the results of deeds in the past life. Present life deeds will be the cause of future life experiences. Every blessing, fortune, poverty and failure in this life is the result of past causes. Will you experience prosperity or poverty in your next life? The outcome can be deduced through your actions and attitude in this life. In this world, it is difficult to know what is going to happen. People deceive, the weather changes, and even the sun and moon dim and shine unpredictably. But the law of cause and effect is easy to understand. 
hopefully, everyone can realize that there are also conditions that lie between cause and effect. It is impossible for a soybean placed on a bare tabletop to sprout, for it lacks the necessary conditions. It is impossible for grains to grow in the dry desert, because there are no supporting conditions to complete the law of cause and effect. Therefore, one must thoroughly understand the relation between cause, condition, and effect. End of chapter 15. Chapter 16 Law of Cause and Effect Across the Three Time Periods As the saying goes, one reaps what one sows. Whether wholesome or unwholesome, each cause will have a corresponding karmic result. But why are some people blessed? with a life of luxury and abundance, despite having committed many heinous deeds, while kind and virtuous people are poverty-stricken. Do cause, effect, and karmic retribution exist in this world? Is it true that one reaps what one sows? Will people who commit wholesome deeds receive wholesome results? Will people who commit unwholesome deeds face unwholesome consequences? To understand the laws of cause and effect and karmic retribution, one must understand what is meant by the saying, present life experiences are the results of deeds in the past life. Present life deeds will be the cause of future life experiences. Whether one experiences blessings or adversity, wealth or poverty, there are all effects resulting from past actions. All actions, whether wholesome or unwholesome, determine the outcome of one's next life. For example, there is no law barring people from withdrawing from their own savings account even if they have committed a crime. All the same, a person still needs to pay off their past debts, no matter how reputable or ethical they may appear to be. Even Modgalyayana, foremost in supernatural powers, could not escape his karmic debt and was stoned to death by a group of non-Buddhists. Likewise, the awakened Buddha had to bear the consequences of his past karma such as going through six years of ascetic practice, being deprived of any offerings, and having to eat nothing but grains for 90 days. Karma is not determined by fate or controlled by others. Each person must face the consequences of their actions. There is no such thing as a lucky escape, nor should the concept of karma be distorted. As everyone is equal before the law of cause and effect, it can be said to be the world's most just arbitrator. Thus, causes and effects cannot be fully understood if examined only through a brief period of circumstances. Causes and effects stretch across the span of the three time periods, each affecting the other. The past affects the present, the present determines the future, and the future will affect an even longer extent of time. However, the past is in the past, and the future is yet to come. There is only the present moment, and the three time periods are all in a moment's thought. A single wholesome or unwholesome thought changes the causes and effects of the three time periods and the course of one's life. Therefore, if one wishes to change cause and effect or alter one's fate, the only way possible 
is to stay in the present moment. Be it a thought of remorse, wholesomeness, compassion, kindness, gratitude, or reflection, a single thought is all it takes to transform sadness into happiness, hell into heaven, or a villain into a Buddha. As an ancient saying goes, a single moment of thought suffices to penetrate through from the sky to the core of the earth. Even a passing thought bears long-lasting effect on one's speech and actions. A person willing to transform one's thoughts knows to seize the present moment to cultivate the body and mind. In this way, one's karma of the three time periods is purified through what is good, virtuous, and beautiful. As such, one's causes and effects are transformed for the better, creating endless possibilities in one's life. One who believes in the law of cause and effect knows to apply it directly to their daily lives. A thorough understanding of cause and effect and the purification of one's thoughts enables one to be fearless, positive, and optimistic, whether in the past, present, or future. One will not fear cause and effect. Hence, while a person may live without faith, he or she must not live without the belief in cause and effect. End of chapter 16。Chapter 17カーメック・ロワーズ・アンド・レトリビューションズ。The law of karmic rewards and retributions is a fundamental teaching in Buddhism. Each cause has a corresponding karmic effect, whether wholesome or not. No phenomenon in this world arises without cause and condition. It is impossible to escape the effects of karma committed. Every action, every expression, and even every thought committed, whether good or bad, wholesome or unwholesome, will result in some form of effect and consequence. Every day in the morning, if one wakes up with the thought of helping and serving others, then one will be in heaven, for one has given rise to wholesome thoughts and kind intentions. However, in the afternoon, perhaps, one's mind gives rise to afflictions, anger, and hatred after meeting unpleasant people. One has then fallen back down to hell. Every day, the mind travels between heaven and hell countless times, each time resulting in wholesome and unwholesome karma. As the saying goes, Wholesome actions bring wholesome results. Unwholesome actions bring unwholesome results. Worry not that there are no results. It is only a matter of time. In Buddhism, the consequences of wholesome and unwholesome causes and effects stretch across the three time periods, from past to present, from present to future, And from future to beyond. This is also known as the cycle of affliction, karma, and suffering. When afflictions arise, one creates karma through one's actions, leading to the experience of suffering. After experiencing suffering, more afflictions arise, leading to an unending cycle of consequential actions and suffering. As the saying goes, one reaps what one sows. Even if the connection between cause, effect, and karmic results is complex, 
it works in perfect order. However, many people do not understand the mechanism behind the law of cause and effect. Some people become disheartened when they see someone not receiving good results upon doing a good deed. It is like putting a fixed deposit in the bank. One cannot withdraw money until the given maturity date. On the other hand, some people have committed evil in the world and yet still live a luxurious life. That is because their past savings in the bank have yet to deplete. The bank cannot refuse someone's withdrawal of funds just because they are wicked. Thus, one will always reap what they sow. No one can escape this. Wholesome and unwholesome karmic results are also like farming. Cause and effect that occur within a year, karma bearing fruit in this present life, can be likened to crops that are planted in spring and harvested in autumn. Cause and effect that occur in two years, karma bearing fruit in the distant future, can be likened to crops that are planted this year and harvested the next. A cause that takes many years to take effect, even up to subsequent lifetimes, can be likened to crops that need 3, 5, 8 or 10 years of growth to be harvested. Just like the blossoming and fruition of trees and plants, there are differences in time and season for each species. Wholesome and unwholesome karmic results also have differences in time frames. No matter if the result occurs in this life, the next life or future life, one will surely receive the result sometime. However, it is difficult for most people to understand the true meaning of cause and effect. For example, some people become vegetarian, chant the Buddha's name, or do wholesome deeds to become rich. This is a misguided way of thinking as becoming vegetarian, chanting the Buddha's name, and doing wholesome deeds do not correlate to the effect of wealth. The aforementioned causes are on morality and faith. If one wants to become wealthy, hard work is needed in one's career, and forming affinities with others through service. This is the cause and effect of becoming wealthy. Some people want to be healthy. So they fix bridges and build roads, or offer tea and light to others. However, this does not lead to good health, for these actions are misguided. To be healthy, one should eat nutritiously, exercise and learn to take care of one's body. These are the causes of good health. A person who fixes bridges and roads will only be known as a humanitarian, a good person that does wholesome deeds. These actions lead to different effects. So, planting soybeans hoping to reap watermelons, or planting watermelons hoping to reap soybeans, is a distortion of the law of cause and effect. Many people misunderstand the law of karmic rewards and retributions in terms of time and in terms of the connection between cause and effect, blaming it as defective and ambiguous. Yet, in fact, karmic rewards and retributions are far more precise than computers and scientific instruments as they never miss. One can lie to others and even to themselves but karmic rewards and retributions never lie. One can deceive everyone, but one can never escape the results of one's dishonesty. While people may not see our acts, heaven is always watching. The law of cause and effect 
is a record that nothing can escape. How can you get away with your lies? Karma refers to actions that will surely yield results. Hence, people who commit wholesome deeds should believe in cause and effect and need not worry about karmic results. Even though one may yield bad karmic results after committing wholesome deeds, worry not, for it is like repaying debts. Once the debts are cleared, effects from wholesome deeds will return like money earned. Therefore, people who commit wholesome deeds must have a correct understanding of karmic rewards and retributions. Do not believe in hearsays. Do not misunderstand or blame the workings of cause and effect. That would be ignorance indeed. End of chapter 17「Chapter 18 – Twelve Links of Dependent Origination » Human life spans across three time periods – past, present and future. Buddhism explains this process with the cycle of the twelve links of dependent origination. Number 1 – Ignorance Number two, mental formation. Number three, consciousness. Number four, name and form. Number five, six sense organs. Number six, contact. Number seven, feeling. Number eight, craving. Number nine, clinging. Number ten, Becoming. Number 11. Birth. Number 12. Aging and death. Simply put, the endless cycle of the 12 links of dependent origination is what keeps one in the unending journey of birth and death across the three time periods. Ignorance refers to a lack of understanding in the truth of the universe and life, that all phenomena arise dependent on conditions, and that all phenomena are empty in nature. Due to this lack of clarity, one's intrinsic nature is obscured by the darkness of affliction, hence the term ignorance. Rebirth begins with a single moment of ignorance, which then leads to the arising of mental formation through physical, verbal, and mental deeds, followed by the rise of karmic consciousness. Hence, the concepts of name and form arise while still inside the mother's womb. The combination of a name, mental function, and form, physical function, manifests in the forms of the six sense organs – eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. Once the six sense organs are formed, one is born. Upon the first encounter with the external environment outside the mother's womb, through the six senses, pleasant and unpleasant feelings arise as a result. As such, desire and craving also arise, followed by attachment and clinging, that is, pursuing what one likes and rejecting what one dislikes. This, in turn, causes karmic effects which result in further consequential karmic effects by becoming into the next cycle of birth, aging, sickness, and death. Such is life, a continuous cycle of birth and death. Many would ask, where does life come from? The answer is, life comes from ignorance. 
where does a person go after death? The answer is, one becomes reborn according to one's karma. The past, present and future are cyclically connected. The twelve links of dependent origination continue in endless succession because affliction leads to action, which then leads to suffering, thus creating a feedback loop. The past affects the present, which in turn will also become the past as the future turns into the present. Past, present and future, the three are the causes and effects of one another. According to the Sutra of Cause and Effect of the Three Time Periods, your present life experiences are the result of your deeds in the past lives. Your present life deeds will be the cause of your future life experiences. In other words, all present encounters are caused by past actions. To know the effects of the future, one need only look at present deeds. Therefore, there is no need to wait for the next life to experience the three time periods. Every day is an experience of the past, present and future, for it is a continuous cycle of causes, conditions and effects, where effects embody causes and causes embody effects. The law of cause and effect across the three time periods suffices to answer the questions. Where does life come from? Where does a person go after death? There is no need to seek gods or fortune tellers as these answers should be self-taught. Instead, one should ask, What karma have I caused? And, What actions have I done? What effects will they bring? The answers can be discovered through life experiences. Whatever seeds that are sown in the present, be it wholesome or unwholesome, will come into effect in the future. Therefore, true Buddhist practitioners understand that true reliance is found within oneself, that life is in one's own hands, and that we are the ones who can determine our own future. End of chapter 18。Chapter 19 Metaphors of Cyclic Existence No phenomena in this world can be exempt from cyclic existence. Everything in this world, even thoughts, go through the cycle of formation, stability, decline and extinction. The four seasons cycle from spring, summer, autumn to winter. This is an example of cyclic existence. Likewise, the flow of space and time from the past, present to the future is cyclic existence. Equally is the cycle of wholesome or unwholesome rebirth in the six realms. This continuous cycle of existence follows a fixed principle and sequence, adhering to the law of cause and effect, whereby causes result in effects which in turn become causes to others. This process can be likened to a clock that ticks from 1 to 12 and restarts from 1 again. This is known as cyclic existence. As to the subject of where human beings come from, most religions give a linear explanation, beginning at point A and ending at point B. Cause and effect, as taught in Buddhism, in contrast, is a cyclical process without beginning or end. Cyclic existence is the transformation of life into another. 
Likewise, people go through the process of old age, sickness, death and birth. Life does not simply stop upon death. One is instead reborn. In Buddhism, the cyclic existence of the three time periods refers to the beginningless and endless flow of life, a continuation of causes and effects resulting from physical, verbal and mental karma created by sentient beings since beginningless time. This cycle manifests as six different forms of life, heavenly beings, humans, ghosts and animals, also known as transmigration within the five destinies and cyclic existence within the six realms. The principle of cyclic existence enables one to transcend the bonds of divine control. It allows one to clearly understand that destiny is controlled not by gods or deities, but by one's karma. Moreover, it is not the gods who dispense blessings or misfortunes onto people. These are the consequences of one's actions. From the perspective of cyclic existence, a life of happiness or misery is caused by the individual actions of sentient beings. By believing in cyclic existence, one views life as a continual process instead of a short span of a hundred years. With cyclic existence comes inexhaustible vitality. Just as a seed planted in soil will bear fruit once again, the end of one life cycle marks the beginning of another. Birth brings death, and death brings birth. In this way, the uninterrupted continuation of birth and death brings infinite hope. It is like burning firewood. A piece of wood may be burnt to a crisp, but the blaze continues with the addition of more firewood. Though the pieces of firewood are different, the flame continues to burn. Likewise, an oil lamp spent is replaced by igniting another. Lamp after lamp, the light brings constant illumination to a world of darkness. Cyclic existence offers opportunities for life to change and start anew. It allows the possibility of realizing one's aspirations and atoning for past mistakes. The meaning of cyclic existence lies not in punishing evil people and rewarding the righteous. Rather, it enables clear understanding of oneself and development of self-awakening. With every cycle of existence, one continuously develops and purifies oneself, learning to treat others with kindness and compassion as well as conducting oneself with wisdom. A Buddhist with right view shall not fear cyclic existence. Instead, it is to be realized and transcended. Only then will one be at ease and virtuous when faced with the challenges and afflictions brought about by cyclic existence. End of chapter 19。Chapter 20。Six Sense Organs。There are different parts of the physical human structure。The eyes, ears, nose, tongue and body。have uniquely different appearances, they all work together for the common goal of keeping the human body alive. Similarly, the liver, lungs, intestines and stomach each have a unique function 
that works alongside each other to maintain the regular functions of the body too. Every day, the six sense organs, eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind, come in contact with the six sense objects, cling onto the external environment, and lure one into committing unwholesome deeds. Hence, the Buddhist sutras describe the six sense organs as the six thieves, as they are always stealing one's merits and dharma wealth. Overseeing the six thieves is the mind, the leader that orders the six sense organs about. The mind commands the eyes to look, the ears to listen, the nose to smell, and the limbs to move. As six sense organs are blind to their actions, one must cultivate proper conduct to avoid harm. How does one cultivate the six sense organs? The human body is like a machine, and the eyes like a camera. Usually, cameras are used to capture beautiful images. The eyes should also be used to look at what is wholesome, such as majestic Buddha statues, respectable people, and admirable deeds. However, most people use their eyes to look at the faults of others, while blind to their own shortcomings. This is why people are always complaining about what they dislike and are displeased about. If one can change from looking at the faults of others to reflecting upon one's mistakes and faults, then this is the cultivation of the eyes. The ears are like radios. As the saying goes, good medicine tastes bitter. Honest advice is unpleasant to the ears. Generally, people like to hear praise or listen to pleasant music, but would feel dismayed at receiving honest advice from their friends. If one can happily accept the admonishment of others and even feel joy upon hearing such advice, then this is the cultivation of the ears. The nose is like a detector. The nose is sharp. It chases after fragrant or foul smells like a scout gathering military information. However, most noses only love to seek after the aroma of food and drinks. If one can transcend and smell the fragrant virtues of sages, then this is the cultivation of the nose. The tongue is like a translator or a loudspeaker. Not only does the tongue distinguish between sour, sweet, bitter, and spicy tastes, one with a silver tongue can even use their ability skillfully to spread the truth and speak good words to give others faith and strength. On the other hand, some aim to spoil good situations with harsh words. This is why four of the ten unwholesome deeds concern speech. Thus, the karma of speech must be carefully guarded. Praise others, speak no evil, and speak good words that give others confidence. Ensuingly, what one says brings joy to others, and one's voice will be clear and melodious. To most people, it is a great blessing to feast on all worldly delicacies. However, it is also commonly understood that illness enters through the mouth and misfortune comes out of it. Therefore, one should regularly let the tongue savor the flavor of the Dharma and the truth. This way, one can propagate the teachings of Buddhism. Such is the cultivation of the tongue. The body is an active machine. 
The legs are like a walking module. Past practitioners, fearless of toils, depended on their legs as they traveled across lands to understand their minds and see their intrinsic nature. Hands are like a multi-purpose module that can either do wholesome or unwholesome deeds. For example, using fists to massage someone's back is wholesome, but to strike others is unwholesome. The body can feel the external environment. Most people prefer to come into contact with ambient temperatures and soft, silky objects. Therefore, people want to live a life of comfort sitting on sofas, sleeping on mattresses, and cooling off in air-conditioned rooms. If one can go to a temple on occasion to meditate, prostrate to the Buddha, and practice having an upright posture, one allows the body to encounter a pure state of being. This is the cultivation of the body. The brain is like the general headquarters where the mind acts as the commander. What most people seek are ways to gain benefit, fame, wealth, and success. Taking it a step further, if one can think of ways to increase one's loving kindness, compassion, justice, peace, and ability to help others, especially having a mind that wishes that all beings be relieved from suffering while searching for peace and happiness for oneself. That is the cultivation of the mind. Cultivation is not just about talking the talk, and definitely not about passively keeping one's eyes, ears, and mouth to oneself. Instead, one must truly cultivate and practice. For example, not only should the eyes be prevented from looking around aimlessly, but one should also look to transform adversity into conditions that help one grow. Not only should the ears be stopped from listening to unwholesome things, but one should also transform frivolous speech that was heard into words of self-improvement. Not only should the mouth be stopped from speaking unwholesome words, but one should also praise and encourage others with wholesome and encouraging words. When one truly cultivates the six sense organs, one thus practices the right path in the human world. End of chapter 20. Chapter 21. Metaphors of the Mind Over 2,000 years ago, Sakyamuni Buddha entrusted the wondrous mind of Nirvana to Mahakasyapa at Vulture Peak. The wondrous mind refers to one's intrinsic nature, which is also the truth of the universe and life. In other words, the Buddha entrusted Mahakasyapa with an invaluable understanding of the Dharma realms to share with the world. The Samyukta Agama refers to the mind in the following way. Because the mind is afflicted, living beings are afflicted. Because the mind is purified, living beings are purified. Because of ignorance and affliction, ordinary beings therefore suffer from worry, misery, and distress. These are not caused by the physical heart, but a cognitive and calculative mind filled with hatred, jealousy, ignorance, hypocrisy, selfishness, and attachment. This way, Life is also filled with disputes, discrimination, and disparity. The saying, 
what arises in the mind gives rise to all dharmas, means when ignorance arises, afflictions and suffering will follow. Fortunately, we all have an inherent mind of thusness, though not easily seen because it is covered by the dark clouds of delusion, one will still be able to discover it by practicing the Dharma. So long as one's true Buddha nature is revealed, there is hope for attaining Buddhahood. Therefore, as per the saying, practicing the Dharma requires cultivating the mind, Buddhist practice emphasizes the mind. For example, one should remedy malice through kindness, doubt through faith, selfishness through magnanimity, restlessness through tranquility, and delusion through the truth. Furthermore, upon the highest state, one remedies a discriminating mind through a non-discriminating mind, the non-abiding mind as expounded in the Diamond Sutra. Unlike the physical body, eyes, nose, ears, head, hands, and legs, which are visible, the mind is invisible. Every day, the mind changes in manifold ways, so much so that it is difficult to fully describe its composites and complexity. As such, analogies assist in the implicit understanding of the mind and its appearances. The mind is described in the sutras using countless similes and metaphors, of which ten are listed as follows. Number one, the mind is like a monkey, for it is hard to tame. Refusing to stop even for a moment, the mind heedlessly leaps about, erratic and difficult to control. Number two, the mind is like a flash of lightning. It is as fast as a split second. The speed of light is considered the fastest thing in this world, but the mind is even faster. Just as lightning travels hundreds of miles in one second, the mind can travel across the world in a single thought. Number three, the mind is like a wild deer it chases the sense objects. After filling their stomachs, mountain deer do little except to frolic after sounds and colors to amuse themselves. Likewise, the mind chases after sensual distractions without pause. Number four, the mind is like a thief. It steals one's merits. It is frightening that the mind one nurtures is capable of committing transgressions, just as a thief perpetuates a crime without restraint, plundering one's merit and virtue. Number five, the mind is like an adversary. It causes suffering to the body. Sometimes the mind protects and other times it betrays. A single thought that leads to unwholesome conduct brings suffering to one's life. Number six, the mind is like a page. It brings many vexations. Though the mind follows and obeys commands, it can also bring disputes and afflictions. Number seven, the mind is like a king. It has supreme power over the body. All his subjects, eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, must heed its command. If the king is benevolent, he will lead his subjects in doing good. If he is wicked, then his subjects are in trouble. For example, King Ahsoka was known as Black Ahsoka and White Ahsoka due to the different approaches in his leadership before and after he encountered Buddhism. Number eight, the mind is like an ever-flowing spring. It is inexhaustible. 
like a spring, a source for clean or polluted water, the mind can be clear or murky. If the fountain of one's mind continuously streams pure water, one's neighbours, colleagues and friends will also enjoy its benefits. Number 9. The mind is like a painter that can draw so much. Every one of us is a sculptor. We can sculpt ourselves into the image that we want because our mind is our sculptor. We can also paint ourselves into the shape we desire because our mind is like a painter. We can treat whatever problem our mind suffers and be our own therapist, for our mind is a great physician. No matter what we want to be, our mind is in command. Number 10. The mind is like space. It is boundless. What is the true mind? While the mind can be like a monkey, lightning, a wild deer, a thief, an adversary, a servant, a king, spring water, or an artist, one's true mind is as vast and boundless as the universe. The true mind is the Dharma body that neither arises nor ceases. It has no birth nor death. It is eternal nirvana. Therefore, the mind can also be likened to a person. It can be righteous, or like a thief or a monkey, or even like the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. It all depends on how one masters their mind. As the saying goes, all teachings expounded by the Buddha serve the purpose of remedying all minds. Without the existence of all minds, such teachings serve no purpose at all. Some of the similes above depict the mind in a deluded and unwholesome state, which one should not harbour. Instead, one should transform and purify the mind. By transforming an unwholesome mind into a wholesome one, from ignorance to enlightenment, from delusion to the truth, and from delusive consciousness into prajna wisdom, one's true mind comes into being. With it, there is nothing impossible to achieve. End of chapter 21。Chapter 22 On Souls To exist in this world, one needs to have a physical body and, within it, a soul, or as Buddhism calls it, the Eighth Consciousness, Alaya, or Storehouse Consciousness. The Eighth Consciousness does not act independently. Together with the Five Sense Consciousnesses, Eyes, Ears, Nose, Tongue, and Body, the Sixth Consciousness, Mind, and the Seventh Consciousness, Manas, they are collectively known as the mind and consciousness. Out of all the consciousnesses, the eighth is not only the deepest and the subtlest, it also influences the previous seven. Hence, it is also called the base consciousness. As the first seven consciousnesses are led by the eighth consciousness, they are called the seven transforming consciousnesses. A person's experience of the feelings in life, whether it be joy, anger, sadness, and happiness, results from the first seven consciousnesses. Nevertheless, they cease to function when life ends, leaving only the eighth consciousness, which is the source of life and what leads to one's rebirth. This is what most theories and people refer to as the soul. 
However, Buddhism does not speak of a soul, but uses the term consciousness instead. Yet, as it is shapeless and formless, unfathomable and immeasurable, the concept of the Eighth Consciousness is particularly difficult for people to grasp. In contrast, the term soul is widely accepted, used and understood by everyone. As the saying goes, Dharma is within this world, and there is no awakening apart from it. Why not use soul, as it is more easily understood? Skillful means have always been widely applied in allowing people to know and learn Buddhism, as shown by the saying. First entice others with desire, then lead them into the Buddha's wisdom. Various worldly methods must be employed to propagate Buddhism to all, so one need not reject the usage of skillful means. Phenomena that are difficult to comprehend should be explained and acknowledged, instead of worshipped or treated as superstition. With appropriate moderation, any worldly concept can be used to explain the Dharma. For example, using recent scientific discoveries that have explained the existence of myriad celestial bodies within the universe, one could use the word planet to explain the Buddhist concept of different realms. Another issue of debate is the existence of aliens. The many bodhisattvas from various Buddha lands who came to listen to the Buddha expound the Dharma, Amitabha Buddha, and Buddhas from the Ten Directions could all be considered aliens. Would not this metaphor allow for immediate clarity? Not only should the propagation of Buddhism fit the needs of people and their aptitudes, but it also needs to adapt to changing times. Moreover, it needs to be compatible with current culture, ideology, and trends instead of diverging from society. Just as a song with complex overlapping melodies is difficult to learn, Buddhism should be taught in a relevant way that facilitates understanding and application. In this way, using the word soul can be an acceptable method in explaining the Eighth Consciousness. End of chapter 22「Chapter 23 a facial expression, or a gesture can thrust one into immediate depths of despair and suffering. Disputes over physical space or personal interests can often tear through one's heart like a typhoon or shake one's spirit like an earthquake. Similarly, investors can be caught in a frenzy with every rise and fall of the stock market. People suffer from every promotion or demotion at work. Upon winning the lottery, or unexpectedly receiving a promotion, can one ever remain unmoved? There is an old saying, to remain unmoved by the eight winds. But today, one could say that there are more than just eight kinds of wind. In addition to ocean and mountain breezes, there are also gusts of speech, turbulences of gossip, gales of power, winds of change, all of which blow afflictions into one's mind. During the Song Dynasty, Su Dongpo, the poet, once held a post in Guazhou, Jiangbei, just across the river from Jinshan Monastery at Jiangnan. 
he often engaged in discussions and debates on Chan with Chan Master Fo In, the abbot of the monastery. One day, thinking he had advanced in his practice, Su Dong Po wrote the following poem. I bow to the heaven above all heavens, whose aura shines on the great universe. Sitting upright on the purple golden lotus, unmoved by the eight winds, I am. Simply put, Su Dong Po described his reverence towards the great Buddha and the blessings bestowed to him by the Buddha's radiant light. Moreover, he described his mind as no longer affected or moved by the eight winds, as if it were a Buddha sitting on the lotus throne. Instructing his servant to deliver the poem across the river, Su Dong Po wished to seek validation from Fo In. Upon reading the poem, Fo In did not say a single word, but simply wrote a one-worded comment on it. Fart. When the servant delivered for In's response, Su Dong Po exploded with rage and demanded a boat take him to the monastery immediately. When he arrived, for In was already waiting for him by the riverbank, smiling. Su Dong Po confronted him. Master, what is wrong with my poem? How could you criticize me like that? In reply, Foyin laughed and said, But I thought you were unmoved by the eight winds. How can a simple fart blow you across the river? The eight winds refer to praise, ridicule, defamation, honor, gain, loss, sorrow, and joy all of which stir up emotions every day just like gusts of wind. Though Su Dongpo believed his mind had become unmoved by the external eight winds, the test of a single fart sufficed to fail him. By living in the whirlwind of delusive thoughts, oblivious to one's original mind, the body and mind will never be liberated and at ease. The ups and downs, as well as praise and slander in life, are inevitable parts of life. As such, I propose half and half as a philosophy of life. As the day is filled with light, night is filled with darkness. Spring is warm with blooming flowers, and winter is harsh with extreme coldness. Han Shan once asked Shi De, How should I deal with someone who slanders me, bullies me, insults me, ridicules me, disparages me, belittles me, offends me, or deceives me? Shi De answered, Just tolerate him. Be patient with him. Let him be. Avoid him. Respect him. Ignore him. And wait for a few years to see what becomes of him. Tolerance and patience cultivate one's magnanimity. Avoidance and letting others be are ways of preventing conflict. Respect and space show regard for an opponent, allowing one to become greater and stronger. It is like playing basketball. Without opponents, a match cannot happen. Life is filled with trials of honor, disgrace, gains and losses. In complacency, one feels a sense of pride. But, in disappointment, one should not brood over gains and losses, or live in self-denial. Impermanence means that honor, disgrace, gains and losses are all fleeting. If one is over-particular towards them, 
one will be shackled by them like a prisoner. Hence, one should have a mindset as illustrated by the verse, When the wind blows through scattered bamboos, as soon as it passes, the sound also leaves. When a goose flies over a winter pond, as soon as it passes, its reflection too flies away. When immune to the harms of poisonous arrows shot by malicious speech, defamation, honour, pride or disgrace, one can truly be considered carefree, unmoved by the eight winds. End of chapter 23「Chapter 24 Remorse」Remorse is the utmost virtue in this world. Remorse means to feel ashamed when one's knowledge, aspiration, loving kindness and compassion are lacking. Remorse is a sense of apology toward others, such as parents and friends, when one has failed them. Remorse is not a word that is used to scold others. Rather, it is to feel ashamed of one's unwholesome behaviour and thoughts, and having the awareness to repent and remedy them. Thus, this motivates one to improve. Mistakes in action and speech are unavoidable in life. Be not afraid of making mistakes. It is the lack of shame and remorse that one should fear instead. With a sense of shame and remorse, one has the power to change and the courage to start anew. There is a saying in Confucianism, To err is human. To correct a mistake is the greatest good. Buddhist masters often advise their disciples, Be ashamed for not knowing. Be ashamed for not being able. Be ashamed for not knowing how. Be ashamed for not being pure. Having remorse is like donning an elegant gown where one emits an aura of nobility. As said in Buddhist sutras, being clothed with a sense of shame is the foremost adornment. Likewise, the Confucian teaching of the four moral standards and eight virtues serves as a reminder to never forget a sense of remorse. A person with remorse knows to work vigorously. A person with remorse will strive for mastery. Therefore, a sense of remorse and shame are virtues. When presiding over the Taking Refuge and Five Precepts ceremony, I often give the example of a Buddhist who drinks. A Buddhist who drinks commits a lesser offence than the average drinker. How so? Would someone who has taken the precepts dare drink in front of others? No, they would not. Instead, they would drink in a corner unseen by others and feel remorseful afterward as they have already taken the precepts. With remorse, the transgression is lesser. On the other hand, those who not only drink excessively to the point of intoxication, but also encourage others to do so by urging others, come on, one more cup, commit a much severe transgression. Therefore, learning to admit one's faults will enhance one's moral character. In the past, Venerable Tzu Hang always gave away even his most prized possessions. He once told me, In this lifetime, I feel remorseful because I lack meritorious causes and conditions. 
Therefore, I cannot miss any opportunity to broadly establish good affinities. Venerable Da Xing once supervised a publication comprising of essays that criticize Buddhism, but Venerable Yin Guang admonished him for creating negative verbal karma. To express remorse, Venerable Da Xing named the book Kao Ye Ji, a collection of verbal karma. Taking example from eminent masters who strove for self-improvement and took responsibility for their mistakes, a person who cultivates a remorseful conscience from a young age will not offend or violate others. They will be able to correct past wrongdoings, resulting in the improvement of their character and moral courage. Moreover, they understand to respect others, thus eliminating negative karma and progressing towards liberation. Just as Venerable Ying Guang called himself an oft-repenting monk in the past, practitioners of today should take remorse as their fundamental creed in conducting themselves in interpersonal situations. A sense of remorse enables a person to be cautious as well as to self-exhort and self-reflect. Naturally, the body and mind are continuously purified, improved, and elevated. End of chapter 24「Chapter 25 – Loving Kindness and Compassion » Loving kindness and compassion are wealth common to all beings. The radiance of loving kindness and compassion warms the world with hope. Loving kindness means bringing happiness to others, and compassion means alleviating the suffering of others. Upon seeing others in pain, one is willing to remove their sufferings and give them joy. Loving kindness and compassion are the heart of Buddhist teachings. The saying, cultivate unconditional loving kindness and universal compassion is often heard. However, loving kindness and compassion are not exclusive to Buddhists. One should not expect loving-kindness and compassion from others, but practice it towards others. Instead of reserving one's love, kindness and compassion for family and friends, unconditional loving-kindness means being kind and compassionate even toward those whom one does not have affinities with. True loving-kindness and compassion means helping whoever needs help, no matter if known or related to that person. Universal compassion is to regard oneself and others as the same. It is not difficult to practice loving kindness and compassion. The key is putting oneself in others' shoes. When others are in need, one offers help. When one is in need, one also seeks help from others. By putting oneself in others' shoes, a mind of loving-kindness and compassion will naturally arise. I always tell my disciples, one can be without anything, but never without kindness and compassion. Not only are loving-kindness and compassion fundamental to the Buddha's teachings, but they are also qualities that everyone should possess. However, if practiced improperly, kindness and compassion can become unwholesome. 
For example, parents who condone their children's wrong behaviors may create social problems. Tolerance for crime and misconduct causes social disorder. Senseless donation encourages greed. The excessive practice of life releasing harms instead of saving lives. These actions originate from the lack of right understanding and moral courage. Therefore, true loving kindness and compassion should be guided by wisdom and right view. If not, excessive kindness and compassion lose their original benevolence and goodwill. True loving kindness and compassion include not only amiable compliments or encouraging words. Great kindness and compassion can sometimes take the form of Vajra strength to defeat evil. For instance, a statue of Maitreya Buddha at the mountain gate smiles and welcomes all who visit the monastery, embracing them with the power of loving kindness and compassion. However, after crossing the mountain gate, one sees a statue of a brave and mighty Dharma protector, the heavenly general Skanda. He wears armor and carries a Vajra staff, defeating evil and subduing defilements with the power of loving kindness and compassion. Some are motivated to improve by the kind and compassionate encouragement of love, while others become vigilant through strict admonishments. Likewise, a gentle breeze in spring and summer rain may encourage the rapid growth of plantation, but a chilly frost in autumn and deep snow in winter can also allow plants to become even lusher. However, most people usually practice momentary compassion or enthusiastic compassion. Rarely do they practice silent compassion or eternal compassion. What is meant by momentary compassion? For example, giving money to the poor only provides temporary relief to their dire situation. An example of enthusiastic compassion is a solemn and serene Dharma service, affecting the participants only for the duration of the service. What is silent compassion? For example, people pursuing cultural endeavors must endure loneliness as they work in solitude. Although unnoticed by many, the impact made by these unsung heroes is immense. Examples of practitioners of eternal compassion include those who establish schools, inspiring the development of wisdom through education, as well as authors who spread beautiful and virtuous ideas through their writings. These are all exemplars of eternal compassion. If one could care for others with a compassionate mind, view the world with compassionate eyes, compliment others with compassionate words, and do wholesome deeds with compassionate hands, one's heart will accord with compassion. Not only will one be more compassionate, but also suffuse the whole universe with compassion. Loving kindness and compassion are like a priceless passport. A person may own nothing, but no matter where they go, happiness and safety will follow. End of chapter 25Chapter 26 Aspiration It is said in the sutras, eradicating all evil is called merit, accumulating all goodness is called virtue. Merit and virtue are accomplished and nurtured through aspiration. Therefore, 
Among the many teachings in Buddhism, an aspiring mind is the most important. Buddhism likens the mind to a field or ground. Aspiration develops the ground of our minds. Through this process of development, the ground becomes something that can be built upon and put to use. Through tilling the worldly fields, seeds can be sown and the harvest gathered. Similarly, if one understands how to develop the field of the mind, then the treasures of the inner mind can be unearthed one by one. If one does not develop the field of the mind, even if external conditions are aligned and one's blessings and virtues are enough, one will not be able to nurture the sprouts of Bodhi. It is like a seed. Without a good field to grow in, it will never be able to blossom or bear fruit. Master Sheng An said, To enter the way, aspiration is paramount. Only with an aspiring mind can Buddhahood be attained. In this world, the greater the aspiration, the greater the accomplishment will be. Thus, the power of aspiration is inconceivable. Confucianists often tell people to establish resolve. And Buddhist practitioners would tell people to make vows. Establishing resolve and making vows are the same as giving rise to aspiration. Upon making an aspiration, resolve is established. Upon establishing resolve, a vow can be fulfilled. There was once a practitioner who had attained arhathood. One day he went out with his disciple who followed along carrying his luggage. Suddenly the disciple thought to himself, the world is full of disasters and calamities. Sentient beings have so many sufferings and obstacles. I should aspire to have the great loving kindness and compassion of a bodhisattva to liberate sentient beings. The Arhat teacher read his mind and knew that his disciple had given rise to the mind of a bodhisattva. So he stopped and turned to his disciple. Give me the luggage. You should walk in front. The disciple did not understand why, but he nevertheless obeyed his teacher's words. After walking a while, the disciple saw a puddle of water under his foot with thousands of ants trapped in it. He thought to himself, Gosh, the world is so big and there are so many sentient beings. I cannot even save the ants in this puddle. How will I ever be able to save all sentient beings? Walking behind him, his teacher read his mind again and said, Take the luggage back and walk behind me. This story shows how difficult it is to sustain an aspiration that has arisen. The power of aspiration can do its wonders. For example, when I aspire to eat, the food will taste delicious. When I aspire to sleep, I will slumber peacefully. When I aspire to be a good person, I will be perfectly happy and willing to do a good deed. The mind is like a field, a beach, or a new shoreline. Developing it brings out its potentials. When the mind makes an aspiration, the quality of everything we do changes. This is what is meant by the saying, in the presence of plum blossoms, the same moon outside the window thus feels different. It is a shame that most people think only of turning wastelands and hillsides into farmlands and buildings. By incessantly seeking without, we do not realize that our minds have a limitless trove of treasures and limitless potential. An intelligent person should seek within, turning from the external world to the internal world to develop the potential of the mind and its treasures.
Only after developing the field of our mind can we sow seeds, grow them, and harvest them. End of chapter 26「Chapter 27 Vow」It is common knowledge among Buddhists that vows are the key to Buddha's and Bodhisattva's attainments. For example, Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva's 12 great vows, Samantabhadra Bodhisattva's 10 great vows, Amitabha Buddha's 48 vows, and, in particular, Siddhigarbha Bodhisattva's vow, if I do not enter hell to liberate the beings there, who will? I shall not attain Buddhahood until hell is empty. Moreover, while sitting on the Vajra throne under the Bodhi tree, Sakyamuni Buddha vowed, I will not rise from this seat until I become awakened. When the Buddha was about to enter Parinirvana, Aniruddha said, The moon may turn hot and the sun may grow cold, but the Four Noble Truths will never change. This reflects the power of the Buddha's vow and faith. Confucianists emphasize aspiration, and Buddhists refer to this as vow-making. One must not be without aspirations, and the accomplishment of the Bodhisattva path cannot be possible without making vows. According to the Pure Land School, one must first accumulate the three provisions of faith, vows, and practice before one can be reborn in the Western Pure Land. However, by making vows, It does not refer to the vows of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. As disciples of the Buddha, we should ask ourselves, what is our vow? We vow to propagate the Dharma and benefit all beings. We vow to prosper Buddhism. We vow to bring peace and happiness to all beings. Yet, have we taken concrete steps to fulfill these vows? The Buddha was critical of practitioners of the lesser vehicle, comparing them to barren seeds, as they do not aspire for the Mahayana mind, the vow to benefit all beings. Lay Buddhists understand the importance of giving in one's practice, but what are our vows? Of course, it does not necessarily mean making a vow of sacrificing one's body and flesh to feed eagles and tigers like practitioners of the past. Instead, we should follow the examples of Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva's 12 vows, Samantabhadra Bodhisattva's 10 great vows, and Amitabha Buddha's 48 vows. Take the four universal vows, for example. Sentient beings are limitless, I vow to liberate them. Afflictions are endless, I vow to eradicate them. Teachings are infinite, I vow to learn them. Buddhahood is supreme, I vow to attain it. Most Buddhists will boldly chant this verse in the main shrine. But if asked to say it on stage, they dare not say, Sentient beings are limitless, I vow to liberate them. Afflictions are endless, I vow to eradicate them. Practitioners should feel a sense of remorse and say this verse more often. The scope of a person's success can be determined by their childhood ambitions. Likewise, in Buddhism, the extent of a practitioner's vow 
will reflect the depth of their cultivation. Making a vow can be likened to winding a clock or putting gasoline in a car, as it generates a force that propels forward movement. Making a vow is also like installing a compass on a ship, or a student devising a study plan, as it sets a goal for one to follow. Therefore, as recorded in An Inspiration to Give Rise to the Bodhi Mind, that which is unbreakable is not a diamond, but a vow. That which is boundless is not the void, but one's mind. The more magnanimous one's mind, the greater the achievement. The firmer one's vow, the greater the power. Making vows is like studying as one needs to keep improving. Initially, a small vow is made but needs to be gradually expanded so that the power of one's vow is continuously sublimated. For example, vowing to serve and propagate the Dharma to a certain number of people in this lifetime, or vowing to work and toil for all beings and to be a beacon of light for society. In other words, it is the vow to practice and cultivate in the footsteps of the Buddha that makes a person extraordinary. End of chapter 27Chapter 28 Generosity In Buddhism, the six perfections are six ways of cultivation that lead to the cessation of affliction and the attainment of Buddhahood. Through practicing them, one aspires to liberate others and is also liberated in the process. Therefore, the six perfections are practices that simultaneously liberate and benefit self and others. The shift from self-liberation to the willingness to liberate others are two sides of the same coin. Some may ask, how can I deliver others when I have neither attained Buddhahood nor liberation? Bodhisattvas aspire to deliver others before attaining Buddhahood themselves, and the process of doing so is the completion of the Bodhisattva path. The provision of merit is accumulated through liberating others, which eventually also liberates oneself. The six perfections are generosity, precept, patience, diligence, meditative concentration, and prajna wisdom. Most people understand the six perfections merely on a superficial level, thinking that Buddhism only teaches people to rejoice in giving, be self-disciplined by upholding the precepts, endure humiliation and hardship with patience, practice diligently without pause, and duly sit in meditative concentration. Since these sayings do not equate with the aptitudes of sentient beings, they create misunderstandings on the teachings of Buddhism. As none of these examples correctly explain the six perfections, I will now discuss the genuine meaning of the Dharma using the perfection of generosity as an example. The meaning of generosity tends to be limited to monetary donations today, but its definition in Buddhism is much broader. There is the giving of material objects, the giving of Dharma, and the giving of fearlessness. To say that generosity is just about giving money would only offer a basic level of meaning. 
A higher level of generosity than that of monetary donation is the volunteering of one's time, effort, as well as professional skills and expertise at the temple. Even without money or time to volunteer, wholesome and beautiful acts can still be spread through speaking good words. This in itself is also an act of generosity. If a person is unskilled at speaking, they can still rejoice upon seeing the generosity of others by thinking good thoughts, speaking good words, and doing good deeds. The merit from these deeds is the same. In terms of the giving of Dharma, it encompasses offering the Dharma and reasoning to people who lack understanding, and also teaching knowledge and skills that can improve their lives and develop their wisdom. In turn, they will benefit more people. However, while most people find it easy to accept material gifts, not everyone can accept the giving of Dharma or reason. The giving of fearlessness is to alleviate the fear and worry of others. For example, when someone is bullied, one steps in and says, Don't worry, I'm here for you. The giving of fearlessness is acting with a sense of righteousness so that others are no longer afraid. When asked the question, is the act of generosity for the benefit of others or oneself? Seemingly, the act of generosity may appear to be benefiting others but the giver is in fact the true receiver. Just like sowing seeds in a field, the sower is in the end the reaper. Buddhist sutras liken generosity to planting a banyan tree. When mature, it bears tens of millions of fruits. The benefits of giving can be described by the saying, plant one and harvest ten. Plant 10 and harvest 100. Giving is also like drawing water from a well. The more water one is willing to draw for others to drink or irrigate fields, the steadier the flow of water. To receive, one must first give. Thus, the practice of generosity removes greed from one's mind and allows one to broadly form good affinities. Naturally, one will receive inexhaustible Dharma joy and carefreeness. In life, do not be blinded by gold and silver. A warm act of generosity or forming good affinities are more moving and valuable than any amount of gold or silver. Generosity is not all about money. Forming affinities such as sincere praise, a compassionate mind, a nod or simple greeting, and a helping hand are all ways to give joy and happiness to others. These warm and beautiful moments in life are far more meaningful than monetary giving. End of chapter 28. Chapter 29. Precept. People often feel uneasy about Buddhist precepts, because to them, precepts are restrictions that would limit their freedom. As a result, many hesitate to begin learning about the Dharma when realizing that upholding precepts is a part of the Buddhist practice. To them, it is better off not being a Buddhist, otherwise life will be full of constraints and inconvenience. However, precepts are not meant to be restrictive, because when observed well, true spiritual and physical freedom will be ensured. 
The acts of killing, stealing, lying, sexual misconduct, and using intoxicants contravene not only the five precepts of Buddhism, but also the law and social norms of moral ethics. Even without taking the precepts, these transgressions are punishable by law and result in loss of one's freedom. Even if a person, by chance, should escape prosecution, they will still not escape the law of karmic retribution. Unwholesome deeds inevitably result in negative consequences. Therefore, the law of cause and effect can arguably be the leading form of justice in this world. Consequently, not upholding the precepts is akin to not abiding by the law, which results in punishment and the loss of liberty. On the other hand, people who uphold the precepts and obey the law need not worry about imprisonment. Just as the saying goes, a clear conscience is a soft pillow. By refraining from unwholesome acts, one's body and mind will be unconquered by fear. Life will truly be stable, carefree, and happy. Some might worry that after taking the precepts, they might break them. The question is, would one be exempt from the consequences of breaking the precepts even if they had not taken them in the first place? Is killing, stealing, harassment, gossip, lewd behavior, and the impairment of one's judgment allowed even if none of the precepts were taken? Of course not. Therefore, a person should not wait until they have broken the law to realize they have violated the precepts. By then, it is too late for regrets. It is better to take the five precepts and cultivate the mindset of preventing unwholesome actions so transgressions are averted. Should one subsequently break the precepts, having a sense of remorse and repentance is still considered better than not having taken the precepts at all. As such, compared to those who have not taken them, upholding the precepts allows for opportunities to change for the better and to start anew. However, precepts are not easily broken once they are taken. In terms of severity, breaking the precepts range from minor to serious. The most serious transgression is known as parajika. Take killing as an example. A parajika is committed when one kills another person, and this act is unrepentable. Most people will not break this precept readily. Minor transgressions are known as dushkrita. A dushkrita is committed when one unintentionally kills, for example, mosquitoes, cockroaches, or rodents. Although still an offense, if one aspires to remorse, this offense can be mitigated through confession and repentance. Upholding precepts is the foundation for practicing all wholesome and spiritual cultivation. Precepts are not to be recited, but put into practice. For example, by doing good deeds, speaking good words, and thinking good thoughts in everyday life, the three types of karma, physical, verbal, and mental, are purified. This is the actualization of what is meant by do no evil, practice all wholesome deeds, purify one's own mind from the verse of the shared morality of the seven Buddhas. Moreover, to be kind and considerate towards others and to realize the truth of causes, conditions, and effects in everyday affairs are also ways of upholding precepts. 
The significance of precepts is to not violate others. Therefore, in the five precepts, refraining from killing is to not violate the lives of others. Refraining from stealing is to not violate the property of others. Refraining from sexual misconduct is to not violate the body and integrity of others. Refraining from lying is to not violate the reputation and trust of others. Refraining from intoxicants is to not violate the wisdom and welfare of oneself and others. Precepts are like a teacher that guides one through what should and should not be done. Precepts are like a rampart, keeping one safe. Precepts are like a virtuous book, increasing one's virtues so that others feel comfortable in one's company. Precepts are akin to the foundations in building a palace. Without the protection of precepts, the twists and turns of life will be hard to tolerate. There is no need to fear the precepts. Instead, uphold them as carefully as if protecting one's eyes. The true meaning of upholding the precepts starts from not violating others to elevating and protecting all sentient beings. End of chapter 29Chapter 30 Patience Patience is a foremost aspect of one's character. Lack of patience between spouses leads to divorce. Lack of patience between friends leads to animosity, and lack of patience at work leads to quitting and unemployment. It is said in the Sutra that those who cannot take in slander, criticism, or verbal abuse by others as if they were sweet nectar cannot be called a great person of strength. Many believe that patience means not to retaliate physically or verbally, and is a sign of weakness. However, patience takes strength and wisdom. It bears the meaning of understanding, acceptance, responsibility, and mediation. When criticized, a person lacking self-restraint will retaliate. When taken advantage of, someone who feels wronged will seek revenge. If one does not have the power to accept and shoulder responsibilities faced with all manner of people, situations, and wealth, Will a life without patience be a happy one? Sometimes patience is practiced not just for oneself, but for the sake of others. What benefits others should be done patiently despite grievances. What does not benefit others should not be done, despite the loss of benefits. Once there was a Buddhist temple. When devotees come to pray, it is customary for them to strike the big gong and offer incense and flowers. One day, the big bronze gong became extremely unhappy and complained to the bronze Buddha. O oh Buddha, you and I are both made of bronze. Why do devotees prostrate to you, offering flowers and candles? Not only am I deprived of the same treatment, they even strike me and say things like, the louder the better, so that the Buddha will hear us. I cannot bear this. The Buddha listened and answered, Oh, Big Gong, do not feel wronged. Remembering the day when I was forged, the craftsmen pounded and hammered my head. They poked and scraped my ears. I had endured much pounding and hammering hardships and complications to become a Buddha whom people pay respect to. All this honor comes from patience. 
the good karma and conditions I accumulated from my patients are what draw people to me. You, on the other hand, cannot endure such minor and harmless strikes. You cry out, gong, whenever you are struck. Of course, we will be treated differently. One day, Wang Yangming, the philosopher, took his students on a trip, and they saw two ladies arguing on the street. One yelled, You have no conscience. The other replied, You're unreasonable. Wang remarked to his students, Hear ye, hear ye. Here is a lesson on discipline. The students asked, Teacher, where is the discipline in this? They are just scolding each other. Wang answered, To be demanding of others is to berate them. To be self-demanding is to be disciplined. As the saying goes, A moment of patience leads to calm and peace. A step in retreat opens up a bigger world. In one's practice of patience, there are times where one is verbally abused by others. What can be done instead of retaliating, especially when the anger is too great to swallow? At the beginning of one's practice, while anger may still be visible on the face, what can at least be done is to hold one's tongue so that one does not retaliate with words of hostility, abuse, or criticism. Next, as patience increases, one can learn to cope with unhappiness by forcing a smile. In the end, even when bullied or attacked, one remains at peace vocally, physically, and mentally. The highest level of patience is a mind that does not compare or calculate towards others. Thus, the ability to face all situations with unaffected calmness. A face with no anger is a true offering. A mouth that speaks no anger is fragrant and fresh. A lasting smile is a form of offering. Speaking good words and refraining from harmful language will also earn the respect of others. Is it an advantage or disadvantage to be patient? The answer is the former. Patience may be seen as putting oneself down, but this is not the case. Patience increases one's interpersonal affinities, wisdom, compassion, and strength. The benefits of practicing patience are unparalleled. Patience is neither passively compromising nor holding in one's anger. It is kind and compassionate tolerance for others. Those who practice patience and compassion truly understand that all are one and equal. They understand that fighting disputes with disputes is a never-ending cycle. Ending disputes with patience is the true display of Dharma. Accepting disagreements with a tolerant mind and refrain from comparing and calculating. If achieved, everything with or without reason will become a chance for personal growth and an increase in merit and virtue. The greatest benefit of practicing patience would be the ability to regard everything with an ordinary mind. End of chapter 30。Chapter 31 Diligence。Name someone who has ever succeeded without hard work。Anyone who prefers an easy, comfortable life。despises work, and avoids being of service, will never succeed even if money falls from the sky. 
Reaping what one sows is the unchangeable prevailing law of cause and effect. Diligence has its reward, play has no gain. Hard work and diligence are antidotes to laziness and indolence. Indolence is a threat to all practices and life's ill. As the saying goes, if lay people are lazy, they lose the benefits of the mundane world. If monastics are indolent, they lose the Dharma gem. Hence, diligence is the key to success in life. Of course, diligence needs to be appropriate and beneficial for self and others. This is called right effort. According to Buddhist sutras, there are four types of right effort. Number one, to prevent unwholesome states that have not yet arisen. Number two, to end unwholesome states that have already arisen. Number three, to develop wholesome states that have not yet arisen. Number four, to strengthen wholesome states that have already arisen. For unwholesome deeds and thoughts yet to arise, prevent them by using one's wisdom. For unwholesome deeds already committed, one should bravely repent and end them. For wholesome deeds and thoughts yet to arise, one should develop them with courage and motivation. For wholesome actions and thoughts already existing, one should protect them so they are enhanced. In short, one should be hardworking and diligent in preventing the unwholesome and cultivating the wholesome. One cannot afford a moment of laziness or indolence. In Buddhist temples, monastics strike the wooden fish during morning and evening chanting because the eyes of a fish never close regardless of day or night, which serves as a symbolic reminder for monastics to cultivate diligently. Upon hitting or seeing a wooden fish, one contemplates deeply on the diligence of a fish to learn from it. As said in the Buddhist sutras, life shortens as each day ends. Like fish running out of water, what joy is there? Strive on diligently and vigilantly, as if there is fire on one's head. Be mindful of impermanence and never fall indolent. This verse serves to admonish while also to encourage all to practice diligently and not let time pass in vain. In Buddhism, there are many bodhisattvas with names such as never resting bodhisattva and constant diligence bodhisattva. They also serve as a reminder for people not to be indolent and lax, but to be diligent in cultivation. Just as Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva reaches out to sentient beings across all worlds, and Siddhigarbha Bodhisattva liberates sentient beings in hell, generations of Buddhist masters have worked tirelessly and wholeheartedly to serve sentient beings. Many bodhisattvas and eminent monastics even willingly gave their heads, eyes, brain and marrow to accomplish their personal vows. During his reign, Emperor Yongzheng of the Qing dynasty had such deep admiration for Master Yulin, the late teacher to Emperor Kangxi, that he searched everywhere for his successor. After looking far and wide, all he found was an ordinary-looking, inarticulate and unawakened monastic. Most displeased, Emperor Yongzheng admonished the monk as a disgrace to his Dharma ancestors and then locked the monk in a room. The emperor hung a sword over the door and forced him to either attain awakening within seven days 
or be beheaded. Being put in the life and death moment, the monk cultivated diligently and was finally awakened. Diligence inspires the cultivation of all wholesome deeds and calls for all merits and virtue. Without the practice of diligence, the remaining five of the six perfections cannot be achieved. According to the Great Perfection of Wisdom Treaties, diligence is the foundation of all wholesome states. It gives rise to all dharmas, eventually leading to the attainment of Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi. Is diligence a difficult or joyous practice? As a matter of fact, while the practice of diligence may appear arduous, its results are in fact joyous. As said in An Inspiration to Give Rise to the Bodhi Mind, Temporary is the arduousness of spiritual cultivation. Prevalent is the arisen diligence, and forever the tranquility. Laziness may win in a lifetime of ease, only to be followed by many lifetimes of suffering. End of chapter 31Chapter 32 Meditative Concentration In Buddhism, meditators are often instructed to restrain the six sensory roots and to subdue and guard the mind. The practice of meditative concentration is to subdue the mind and focus upon one subject. Is Chan lively or dull? Chan certainly is lively. Most people think the way to achieve meditative concentration is to observe the mind whilst motionless during sitting meditation and that action or movement would hinder the practice. However, sitting meditation is merely a method that helps give rise to meditative concentration and wisdom. Liveliness is what Chan is about. Be it fetching wood or carrying water, drinking tea or eating food, walking, sitting or reclining, talking, silence, and even raising an eyebrow or winking, these all embody the spirit of Chan. Chan is a confident and unrestrained attitude towards all situations of life. It is humor in the face of adversity. Once, during a discussion between Chan Master Chao Zhou and his disciple Wen Yuan, a devotee came and offered a piece of biscuit. Chao Zhou asked, Who among the two of us shall eat this biscuit? Why, you, of course, master, said the disciple. That's unfair, said Chao Zhou. Why don't we have a bet? We will bet to lose, not to win. The person who loses gets the biscuit. What's the bet, master? Whoever degrades himself in the lowest way wins. After you, master. Cao Zhou began. I am a donkey. Wen Yuan was shocked that his master would compare himself not only to an animal, but to a donkey. He replied after deep pondering. I am the donkey's backside. I am the dung in the donkey's backside. Wen Yuan immediately replied. I am the maggot in the dung. Cao Zhou could not think of a worse comparison, so he asked, What is a maggot like you doing in the dung? Just chilling out. Chilling out in dung is the spirit of Chan. 
In this day and age, living in a high-rise with sofas and air conditioning can still be uncomfortable for some. But Chan masters can chill out in Dung. Is this not self-mastery and perfect ease? Once someone asked a Chan master, How do you cultivate? I eat and sleep every day. Hey, so do I. So I'm cultivating as well? Oh no, you eat and sleep differently. Everything I eat tastes delicious, and I fall asleep as soon as I get in bed. You, on the other hand, pick at your food and fidget in your sleep. How can that be called cultivation? Chan is not exclusive to Buddhism or any individual. Who does Chan belong to? Chan is the treasure that lies within everyone. The goal of practicing Chan is to enliven the spirit of Chan within. If one could apply the spirit of Chan in daily life, one can be flexible and wise in resolving daily affairs. The wondrous spirit of Chan is like a pinch of salt that adds flavor to a dish, a picture that brightens a room, or a flower that adds color to life. One's life, actions, and speech will be different once the spirit of Chan is discovered. Chan can only be awakened to, not learned. Chan must be cultivated and experienced in daily life instead of seeking to understand it through knowledge. One who has a tranquil mind through cultivating meditative concentration will not be affected or surprised by what others say or what happens in reality. With the spirit of Chan, one can be at ease anywhere. With the spirit of Chan, one will not squabble about mundane affairs or worldly power and fame. How can Chan be practiced in daily life? Focus and concentrate on one thing at a time. Focus fully on each task at hand and be kind to others. One day, awakening can be achieved. Chan practitioners must extract their inner spirit of Chan. A life lived in Chan will be at peace, ease, and harmony with everything. End of chapter 32。Chapter 33 Prajna Wisdom Prajna Wisdom is regarded as the eye of the six perfections. Just as said in the sutras, the first five perfections are like the blind, in which the sixth perfection is the guide. Thus, the importance of prajna wisdom can be seen. Is prajna wisdom sought internally or externally? Intelligence and worldly knowledge, such as science or philosophy, acquired externally are incomparable to prajna wisdom, which comes internally. Prajna wisdom is the ability to attain inner awakening. It is to have the right view that all phenomena are dependent in origination and therefore empty in nature, thus leading to complete and perfect arising wisdom, both internally and externally. Living with Prajna Wisdom helps to eliminate interpersonal conflicts and enables freedom from ignorance and afflictions. Prajna Wisdom is the profound and wondrous stage of awakening attained by all Buddhas. Put simply, Prajna Wisdom can be divided into four levels. Number 1. Right View Wisdom as understood by sentient beings. Number two, dependent origination. 
wisdom as understood by the two vehicles, Shravakas and Pratekya Buddhas. Number three, emptiness, wisdom as attained by Bodhisattvas. And number four, Prajna, true wisdom that is only attained by Buddhas of the three time periods. In other words, Prajna wisdom can only truly be understood upon the attainment of Buddhahood. The Prajnaparamita Heart Sutra states, Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva, while contemplating profoundly the Prajnaparamita, realized that the five skandhas are empty. This represents awakening and Prajna wisdom. Prajna wisdom is different from ordinary wisdom, and it does not equate with knowledge. Ordinary wisdom and knowledge view things as either wholesome or unwholesome, right or wrong, and beneficial or detrimental. A person with Prajna wisdom has complete right view. They are not easily affected by external afflictions, so they do not give rise to defilements, create negative karmic actions, or suffer as a result. Hence, if one's views of the world are correct, one possesses mundane prajna wisdom. Sages like the Shravakas and Pratakya Buddhas view the world as being dependent in origination. This means that all conditioned phenomena in this world do not arise from nothing and are unable to exist as their own entity. Their appearance and existence arise from a combination of various causes and conditions. Therefore, wholesome causes and conditions must be cultivated to live a happy life. One must broadly form affinities and develop them to have harmonious interpersonal relationships. If one is always calculative on the effects that should be received, and always complaining about fate or blaming others, one will only be stuck in a cycle of ignorance and afflictions. Prajna wisdom as understood by bodhisattvas is the concept of emptiness, one's original nature. Wondrous existence arises from true emptiness means that only with emptiness is existence possible. Everything in the universe and in this world can come into being because of emptiness. For example, one's pockets need to be empty to carry money. One's nostrils need to be empty to breathe. One's stomach and intestines need to be empty to ensure a continued healthy life. The concept of right view, dependent origination and emptiness are hard to grasp. It is even more difficult to understand Prajna wisdom. Indeed, what is Prajna wisdom? Prajna is the complete and clear wisdom of awakening that all Buddhas attain through realizing the true form of all phenomena. Prajna is pure wisdom without discrimination, to be without deluded emotions or thoughts. Prajna is true and formless wisdom, the direct realization of intrinsic empty nature and that there is nothing to be attained. Prajna wisdom not only leads one to thoroughly awaken to the true form of all phenomena, but rids one of all delusions. Thus, one attains liberation. More importantly, Prajna wisdom is the eyes to the Bodhisattva's practice of the six perfections. With Prajna wisdom, a Bodhisattva joyfully gives without attaching to the notion of generosity, upholds the precepts without attaching to its form, is patient without attaching to the notion of self, is diligent without giving rise to arrogance, and practices meditation without attaching to samadhi. Prajna is the guide which the other five perfections follow. Without it, 
the other five perfections are blind. Put differently, the first five perfections are worldly Dharma practices. Only by incorporating Prajna wisdom do they become transcendental Dharma practices. For example, practicing generosity with Prajna wisdom enables one to realize the emptiness of the three aspects of giving, i.e. giver, receiver, and what is given. Upholding the precepts with Prajna wisdom allows one to benefit sentient beings. Having patience with Prajna wisdom leads one to realize the patience of non-arising dharmas. Being diligent with Prajna wisdom empowers one to progress tirelessly. Practicing meditative concentration with Prajna wisdom leads one to realize and awaken to Buddhahood. To achieve liberation through the first five perfections, one must practice with the skillful means of non-attainment, in other words, Prajna wisdom. Taking the practice of the six perfections as a whole. Number one, the practice of generosity. Not only does one overcome greed, but it also benefits others. Number two, the practice of discipline. Not only will one prevent harming oneself, but others as well. Number three, the practice of patience. Not only does one overcome hatred, but it will also not harm others out of hatred. Number four, the practice of diligence. Not only does one overcome indolence, but it also teaches others not to be indolent. Number five, the practice of meditative concentration. Not only does one overcome a scattered and distracted mind, but it also teaches others not to be distracted and unfocused. Number six, the practice of wisdom. Not only does one overcome ignorance and deviant views, but it also teaches others to overcome ignorance and deviant views. The six perfections offer a positive practice of bodhisattvas. The meaning behind this practice is profound, for it helps one to establish wholesome dharma in life, to preserve a continuous enthusiasm for learning in life, and to finally reach the ultimate shore of perfection. End of chapter 33。Chapter 34 Who is the Buddha's mother? All through life, we come across different kinds of parents who nurture our growth and support our development. When born, our biological parents provide care and education. Farmers, artisans, and merchants are parents who provide daily necessities. Wise and virtuous friends are parents who provide development, guidance, and leadership. Mother Earth is also a parent who provides sustenance and life to all beings. Likewise, as causes and conditions give rise to all phenomena one experiences throughout life, there are also like one's parents. Furthermore, according to the Agamas, all beings in samsara have ignorance as one's father and greed as one's mother. In this way, ignorance and greed can also be called one's parents. What about the Buddha? Did he have parents as well? Who were they? Historically speaking, Prince Siddhartha was born to King Suddhodana and Queen Maya, according to the biography of the Buddha. The Buddha, on the other hand, was born from Prajna wisdom. In other words, 
Though the Buddha's physical body was born from his human parents, his Dharma body was born from Prajna wisdom, the Buddha's true parents. All Buddhas throughout the three time periods rely on Prajna wisdom to eliminate delusive thinking and attain supreme Bodhi. What is Prajna wisdom? Prajna wisdom is the true Buddha nature that everyone intrinsically possesses. It is one's original face that neither arises nor ceases, neither comes nor goes, and is bound by neither time, space, nor discrimination. Without Prajna wisdom, one views all phenomena as mundane dharmas, because one is unable to recognize their true nature or understand one's true self. Only with Prajna wisdom does one truly have the Dharma. For example, the emptiness of the three aspects of giving, the giver, receiver, and gift, can only be achieved when generosity is practiced with Prajna wisdom. Sentient beings are only benefited when one upholds precepts with Prajna wisdom. The patience of non-arising dharmas can only be achieved when patience is practiced with Prajna wisdom. Tireless and continuous effort can be made when diligence is practiced with Prajna wisdom. Awakening can only be attained when meditative concentration is practiced with Prajna wisdom. As shown, Prajna wisdom is extremely important. Where then is Prajna wisdom found? Though Prajna wisdom is the complete and perfect attainment that all Buddhas come from, it is not an enigma. Prajna wisdom must be experienced in everyday life. Once Prajna wisdom deviates from daily life, it is lost. The following passage from the opening of the Diamond Sutra illustrates the daily life of the Buddha, which emits the light of Prajna wisdom. At mealtime, the world-honored one put on his robe, picked up his bowl, and went into the city of Shravasti to beg for food. Likewise, in Chan, getting dressed, eating, fetching wood, and carrying water, or even raising an eyebrow, blinking, and every physical movement can all embody Prajna wisdom. As the saying goes, in the presence of plum blossoms, the same moon outside the window is then different. An ordinary life infused with Prajna wisdom is a life of liberation and ease. Therefore, Teachers who educate the next generation of talents according to their students' aptitudes are practicing Prajna wisdom. Doctors and nurses who give first-rate medical care and look after the sick and needy are practicing Prajna wisdom. Firefighters who jump to the rescue without a thought for themselves are practicing Prajna wisdom. Street cleaners who serve the public by cleaning and sweeping streets are practicing Prajna wisdom. People who recycle and protect the earth quietly are practicing Prajna wisdom. By doing good deeds, one has hands of Prajna. By speaking good words, one has speech of Prajna. By looking at others compassionately, one has eyes of Prajna. By having skillful wisdom and an awakened mind, one has a mind of Prajna wisdom. Wherever Prajna wisdom is found, it is a place worthy of honor. Therefore, a person who is able to experience, practice, and share Prajna wisdom with others is the most honorable one in this world. End of chapter 34
Chapter Thirty Five. Four Immeasurables. It is said in the Avatamsaka Sutra, "Find joy in gentleness and patience. Abide in kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity." Loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity are the four immeasurables. They are the cornerstones of reliance and abiding. By practicing the four immeasurables, one can subdue inner afflictions such as greed, anger, ignorance, and arrogance. The four immeasurables correspond with the working creed for Buddha's light members that I have established for Foguan Shan. Immeasurable kindness is to give others faith. Immeasurable compassion is to give others hope. Immeasurable joy is to give others joy, and immeasurable equanimity is to give others convenience. Through practicing the four immeasurables, one will be able to improve interpersonal relationships. And cultivate merit and wisdom that benefit the peace and happiness of countless sentient beings. How can the four immeasurables become the fundamental guidelines for self-establishment and dealing with situations in our daily lives? Number one, immeasurable loving kindness. In dealing with people. One should always have a benevolent mind that gives others peace and happiness, and shows empathy and willingness to serve others. During the late Qing Dynasty, there was a chess master who hung a plaque in front of his house that proclaimed, "Unbeatable." One day, during an expedition, Minister Zhuo Zongtang passed by the chess master's house. And noticed the plaque. He decided to challenge the chess master, and consequently defeated him thrice in a row. Smugly, the minister said, "You lost three times in a row. It's time to take down that plaque." Several months later, Zhuo returned victoriously and passed by the house again, only to see that the plaque was still there. In reply to the minister's inquiry about why the plaque had not been removed, the chess master said, "May I invite you to another game?" This time, he defeated Zhuo thrice in a row. The chess master then explained, "Last time you visited, I did not wish to demoralize you, for you were headed to a battle." Therefore, I intentionally lost the game. Now that you have returned victorious, I need no longer show you any mercy. The chess master knew when to win and when to lose. Sometimes losing is winning, and winning is losing. Indeed, he was a real chess master who was willing to give others confidence. Number two, immeasurable compassion. Compassion is the intention of helping others transcend suffering and attain happiness. Just as Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva rescues all beings from adversity, a compassionate mind does not discriminate between rich and poor, friend or foe, in the face of worldly suffering. By giving to all beings equally, one is like the sun that shines upon the whole world selflessly. During my early days of Dharma propagation in Ilan, many young people followed me. Today, I have over a thousand disciples and a million Buddhist-like members, all willing to strive for humanistic Buddhism by my side. I have no special skills or teachings. I just tell them there is always hope for tomorrow. 
Through giving others hope, one is heartened about the future. Although hope may not always materialize, a life with hope is a life of wealth, for a goal is set for the future. For example, the Buddha's disciples, such as Sariputra and Purna, were unafraid of challenges and remained optimistic toward all beings. With compassion, they propagated Dharma in barbaric lands, guided the ignorant with bravery, subdued the non-Buddhists, and propagated the righteous Dharma. In helping others, compassion gives others hope. Only in this way can one serve all beings wholeheartedly and never worry about gain or loss, helping eliminate their hardships and suffering so that they too can attain happiness. Number 3. Immeasurable Joy A joyous mind delights in the success of others, no matter whether they are enemies or friends, family or strangers, people with or without affinities. When one treats others with a joyful mind, others will feel warm and assured. Nothing is as valuable as joy in this world. Having too much money may bring misfortune if misused. Having too many possessions may be troublesome if one lacks storage space. Excessive mundane wealth or possessions will inevitably cause problems, but the more joy one gives, the greater the chance in creating a win-win situation. Number 4. Immeasurable Equanimity Equanimity means to relinquish discrimination and attachment, as well as greed and fetters. Equanimity means to give joy and hope to others, and also to willingly give away one's treasured possessions. This enables one to control greed and desire, to achieve liberation, and be at ease. As the saying goes, to give is to gain. By showing a smile, actively helping and serving others, a simple wholesome act such as lighting a lamp or offering a drink will be reciprocated with kindness. Before attaining Buddhahood, one must first develop good affinities. One should broadly form good affinities with others in life. If Buddhist practitioners can uphold the four immeasurables, loving kindness, compassion, joy and equanimity, not only will one's merit and wisdom increase, afflictions will also be eliminated, for these are the four secrets to success in the journey of life. End of chapter 35「that led to the attainment of Buddhahood. To alleviate the suffering of all beings, Medicine Buddha made twelve great vows that realized the pure land of Lapis Lazuli. Avalokiteshvara made twelve great vows that enabled him to answer to a thousand cries for help in a thousand places. Manjushri made twelve great vows so that the free-flowing spring of wisdom may nourish the world. Samantabhadra made ten great vows 
each uniting with the Avatamsaka Ocean. Siddhigarbha made the great vow, I shall not attain Buddhahood until all hells are emptied. I shall not realize the Bodhi vow until all sentient beings are liberated. The aforementioned vows made by the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas can be summarized into the four universal vows. For example, take the sixth and ninth of Samantabhadra's ten great vows, to request the turning of the Dharma wheel and to always oblige all sentient beings. The two accord with the first of the four universal vows. Sentient beings are limitless, I vow to liberate them. The fourth vow, to repent all unwholesome karmas, is akin to afflictions are endless, I vow to eradicate them. The fifth and eighth vow, to rejoice in others' merit and virtue, and to always learn the Dharma, equate with the vow of teachings are infinite, I vow to learn them. Finally, the first, second, third, seventh and tenth vows, namely, to pay homage to all Buddhas, to praise the Tathagatas, to practice offering extensively, to request the presence of Buddhas in the world, and to dedicate merit and virtue to all sentient beings, all mirror, Buddhahood is supreme, I vow to attain it. The four universal vows are the universal vows common to all bodhisattvas. Hence, as said in An Inspiration to Give Rise to the Bodhi Mind, the most supreme amongst the essential elements to entering the way is the making of vows. The making of vows is foremost in the extensive and important task of cultivation. Once vows are made, sentient beings can be ferried to the other shore. Once there is initiative, Buddhahood will be reached. The true meaning of the four universal vows is Number 1 Sentient beings are limitless, I vow to liberate them. Liberating sentient beings is not just a saying. It is a cultivation that should be done in daily life. This can be done by cherishing and not wasting time, by appreciating wealth instead of squandering it, and be thrifty and frugal instead of being extravagant or by protecting nature and preventing pollution and damage. All these actions can help liberate all beings. In the past, some practitioners would not take a single step forward unless they were paying homage to the Buddha. They would not light a candle unless they were reading the sutras. Protecting the ecosystem and valuing resources are the foundation of the vow. Sentient beings are limitless, I vow to liberate them. Number 2. Afflictions are endless, I vow to eradicate them. The sutras describe afflictions as a burning fire, poisonous arrows, tigers and wolves, and dangerous pits that not only harm but also hinder one from peace. Afflictions obstruct one's true Buddha nature from being uncovered. For example, the three poisons, greed, anger and ignorance, disturb one's body and mind, cloud one's wisdom, obstructing one from progressing on the right path. Therefore, continuous self-reflection and repentance are the best ways to eradicate afflictions purify one's mind, be liberated, and at ease. Number 3. Teachings are infinite, I vow to learn them. As the saying goes, 
Millions in wealth cannot compare to a skill acquired. Lay people must acquire different skills and knowledge to make a living. For practitioners, they must have Buddha Dharma atop these skills and knowledge to liberate sentient beings. Therefore, it is necessary to learn the infinite teachings of Buddhism. Mount Taishan is the highest because it does not reject even the smallest heaps of soil. The sea is deep because it does not block out any narrow streams. A person who truly wants to learn the Dharma and walk the path to Buddhahood should be as accepting as Mount Taishan or as boundless as the ocean. Number 4. Buddhahood is supreme, I vow to attain it. It takes a hundred kalpas to perfect the marks of excellence and notable attributes of a Buddha, and three asamya kalpas to perfect one's virtues and wisdom to attain Buddhahood. Success in cultivation does not come easy. However, if one can continue despite all hardships, aspire to make vows that motivate one to strive for the liberation of all beings so all can attain Buddhahood together, then this is truly, Buddhahood is supreme, I vow to attain it. For most people, the four universal vows are usually recited before the Buddha during morning and evening chanting. They dare not talk about it in ordinary life because they believe these great vows are only achievable by bodhisattvas. How can any ordinary person achieve them? However, Huineng, the sixth patriarch of the Chan school, encouraged people that the Dharma is within this world. Apart from the world, there is no awakening. To attain awakening, one should be guided by the four universal vows as a source of strength to progress towards Buddhahood. Likewise, the humanistic Buddhism I propagate also encourages Buddhists to practice the Buddha's way over seeking the Buddha's blessings. One should progress from seeking the Buddha's blessings to believing in the Buddha, praying to the Buddha, and finally practicing the Buddha's way. Henceforth, Buddhists should reassess the importance and value of the four universal vows in their lives. The four universal vows should not be chanted for the sake of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. They should be talked about and discussed, and even more so, practiced and realized in daily life. End of chapter 36「Chapter 37 – Ten Vows of Samantabhadra Bodhisattva » Attainment in Buddhist cultivation depends on one's aspirations and the strength of one's vows. When Prince Siddhartha sat upon the Vajra seat beneath the Bodhi tree, he resolutely vowed, I vow never to rise from this seat until I realize awakening. Amitabha Buddha also made 48 vows to build and adorn the pure land of ultimate bliss. Medicine Buddha and Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva too each made 12 vows, the former to adorn the pure land of lapis lazuli, the latter to listen to the cries of sentient beings for rescuing them. Making vows are significant conditions that aid the success of every endeavor. In Buddhist monasteries, monastics recite the ten great vows of Samantabhadra Bodhisattva during morning and evening chanting. The ten great vows are aspirations in one's cultivation that ultimately lead to perfect Buddhahood. 
The true meaning of Samantabhadra Bodhisattva's Ten Great Vows is explained as follows. Number 1. Pay homage to all Buddhas. Respect for all sentient beings. All sentient beings possess the Buddha nature. To pay homage to all Buddhas means to have respect for all sentient beings. By learning to be in others' shoes, one naturally realizes that this is a shared sentiment among many. In this way, respect will arise. In the Lotus Sutra, Sadhaparibhuta Bodhisattva would say to every person he met, I dare not belittle any one of you, for you are all future Buddhas. Paying homage to the Buddhas means having respect for all sentient beings, and in the process of learning to respect others, one's dignity will also develop. Number 2. Praise the Tathagatas. Give through good speech and language. Tathagata does not necessarily refer to the Buddha, since all beings possess the wisdom and virtues of a Tathagata. By speaking kind words to others, one is praising the Tathagatas. In their past lives, Sakyamuni Buddha and Maitreya Buddha initially cultivated together. But Sakyamuni Buddha was able to attain Buddhahood ten kalpas earlier because of his practice of praising others. Giving praise not only supports and facilitates interpersonal relationships, but it is also an important aspect of cultivation. Number 3. Practice offering extensively. Build good affinities with others. There are many types of offerings in Buddhism. Offering of the pure physical, verbal and mental karmas is considered the best. As the verse goes, A face without anger is a type of offering. Speech without anger gives wonderful fragrances. A heart without anger is like a priceless gem. The eternal truth is beyond worldly discrimination. Praising others through speech and offering one's sincerity, honesty, joy and respect are the best ways to form good affinities with others. Number 4. Repent all unwholesome karmas. Practice introspection in daily living. In Buddhism, it is not troubling if one breaks the precepts. It is more troubling not knowing to repent after breaking them. Just as dirty worn clothes can be washed with clean water, karmic hindrances that arise from internal afflictions can be washed clean with the Dharma water of repentance. Likewise, during the Buddha's time, Devadatta having committed the five heinous crimes, was saved through repentance. As such, introspection and repentance liberates one from the prison of the mind, thereby attaining peace, freedom and tranquility. Number 5. Rejoice in others' merit and virtue. Purify our intentions. Buddhist practitioners hope to harvest their field of merit someday, and so they must constantly sow seeds. However, joyful and pure aspirations are required to accumulate merits. For example, one can praise, extend a helping hand, smile, donate, assist, and rejoice according to conditions. During the Buddha's time, Lady Visaka was so delighted after listening to the Dharma that she donated a pearl dress for the construction of a new Vihara, thus giving the four assemblies a place to listen and practice the Dharma. To act and rejoice in accordance with conditions are ways to practice 
the Buddha Dharma. Nothing will be lost when one rejoices in others. Instead, even more good affinities and luck are gained. Number 6. Request the turning of the Dharma wheel. Request the teachings of the truth. The Buddha Dharma is a vessel that delivers beings in this world. When the Buddha first turned the wheel of the Dharma in Sarnath, he first turned the Dharma wheel for instruction, then turned the Dharma wheel for encouragement, and lastly, turned the Dharma wheel to share his realization. This is known as the three turnings of the Dharma wheel, where the Buddha taught at various levels so all beings could understand and benefit from the teachings. Though the Buddha is gone, every Buddhist can become a manifestation of the truth, turn the Dharma wheel at any time and place, and rejoice in sharing the Dharma with everyone whenever the conditions arise. Number 7. Request the presence of Buddhas in the world. Be respectful and courteous to the sagely and virtuous. When the Buddha was in the world, I was lost. After the Buddha entered Nirvana, I was then born. I repent for all my karmic obstacles that have prevented me from seeing the Tathagata's golden body. Though one cannot meet the Buddha in person, if one understands that everyone possesses the Buddha nature and is a Buddha or a Bodhisattva, then it is also a meritorious deed that supports virtuous people propagating the Dharma. Number 8. Always learn the Dharma, follow the wise. There were 10 great disciples and 1,250 bhikshus who followed and practiced with the Buddha. Hence, they quickly achieved levels of attainment. Now that the Buddha is gone, how can one learn the Dharma? How can one follow wise sages and Dharma friends? One needs to give rise to the four universal vows. Sentient beings are limitless, I vow to liberate them. Afflictions are endless, I vow to eradicate them. Teachings are infinite, I vow to learn them. Buddhahood is supreme, I vow to attain it. One needs to give rise to the four immeasurables, loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity. To always learn the Dharma is to realize that where there is Dharma, there is a way. Number 9. Oblige all sentient beings. Have regard for the perspectives and needs of sentient beings. To practice Buddhism is to let go of personal attachments and guide others through skillful means so that people around us would feel joyful and willing to learn Buddhism. The Buddhist concepts of teaching in different manifestations to accord with different aptitudes, sense of fellowship, and Confucianism's impartial teaching, and to teach according to students' ability, are manifestations of loving-kindness, compassion, and wisdom. Only through these can the Dharma be taught appropriately according to different aptitudes. Number 10. Dedicate merit and virtue to all sentient beings. Integrate all Dharma realms. To dedicate merit means to deposit, just like saving money in the bank. The theory of dedicating merit is akin to lighting one candle with another. The flame of the original candle will not die, 
but instead makes the room brighter, as more candles are lit. Samantabhadra Bodhisattva is the symbol of practice, as well as an example of the Bodhisattva practice in Mahayana Buddhism. The vows made by Buddhas and Bodhisattvas are like a student's homework plan. With a clear goal and motivation, one can progressively realize one's dream step by step. Thus, everyone must aspire to make vows. Only then will one have the motivation to move forward. End of chapter 37Chapter 38 Four Means of Embracing There are numerous ways to deliver sentient beings in Buddhism, one being the four means of embracing, which refers to embracing all sentient beings with four practices generosity, kind words, altruism, and empathy. According to the Avantamsaka Sutra, if one is able to accomplish the four means of embracing, one can bring all beings boundless benefits. The four means of embracing are practiced by bodhisattvas as skillful and expedient means to deliver all beings from ignorance to awakening according to each being's aptitude and disposition. For example, practicing generosity gives rise to favorable impressions. Praising others develops good camaraderie. Altruistic actions give others convenience, and an understanding friendship earns the trust of others. As the saying goes, first entice with desire, then lead into the Buddha's wisdom. These are ways that one can liberate people to enter into the Buddha's teachings. Generosity means to broadly form good affinities with others. In Buddhism, people often praise those who give as having boundless merits. Boundless does not refer to the amount of one's contribution, but the degree of their resolve. The more magnanimous one's heart, the more affinities are formed. As stated in the Diamond Sutra, When a Bodhisattva gives without abiding in any notion, his merit is immeasurable. Give without attachment to the notion of giving, receiving, and what is given, nor with the expectation of gaining something in return. In this way, one experiences the emptiness of the three aspects of giving, which is truly pure giving. Kind words are an art of speaking. Some people speak with hurtful words, some speak hypocritically or dishonestly, and thus are unable to move others. Kind words are not expressions of flattery, adulation, hypocrisy, or nonsense. Praise should be given at the appropriate moment and in an inspiring manner. The language used for teaching lessons should inspire the listener to accept them, clarify any doubts, and happily put them into practice. For instance, Zen master Sengai touched the heart of a novice monk who snuck out of the temple at night with a simple, the night is cold, be sure to keep warm. In response, the novice monk swore off his playful ways and devoted himself to his practice. Likewise, Zen master Ryo Khan inspired his nephew to turn over a new leaf when he said, I'm getting old and have trouble tying my shoelaces. When words are sincere and kind, 
others will naturally feel and accept them. Altruism means to help others progress. A Chinese proverb says, one should give before one can take. Before influencing others, one must first serve others by helping them grow and improve, as well as give others supportive conditions so they can progress and accomplish their goals. Moreover, doing good deeds, speaking good words, and thinking good thoughts are also altruistic acts. This can be as simple as explaining tasks to someone who does not understand, or lend a helping hand to those in need. If one serves others sincerely, and engages in beneficial practices with a joyous mind, then good causes and conditions will arise. Empathy means working with others. In society, people come together to form a party, community, or affiliation due to shared ideology. Similarly, if one wishes to embrace others as friends or colleagues, one must first find similar ideas and values to interact and work together. For example, when meeting an elderly farmer, engage in conversations about topics that are familiar to the farmer. When meeting a child, talk about subjects that children understand easily and find interesting. Whatever the others wish or like, put oneself in the other person's shoes and think in terms of their needs. Cooperation and coexistence in interpersonal relationships depend on shared affinities and ideals. When dealing with people and situations, one is only accepted by others through touching their hearts, bringing them joy, benefiting them, and giving them a chance to shine. It means not to demand that everyone be the same as oneself, whether they be friends, colleagues, family, spouses, or siblings. The four means of embracing help bring people closer together through loving kindness, compassion, and skillful means. It is a wondrous dharma that allows one to improve interpersonal relationships and provides a guideline on managing oneself and dealing with others. End of chapter 38. Chapter 39 The Uniquely Honored One When I wrote the biography of Sakyamuni Buddha in my twenties, it was intended so that people could know more about the founder of Buddhism. In the process, I referenced numerous Buddhist texts to ensure a better understanding of the life of the Buddha myself. At first, I faced certain issues. For example, was it humanely possible that Queen Maya gave birth to Prince Siddhartha from her right flank? Who healed her wound? Moreover, right after birth, the prince was able to walk seven steps, with a lotus flower blooming under each footstep. The prince was then bathed in water, spouted by nine dragons. Can a newborn immediately walk with ease? This is improbable from a medical perspective. As for the dragons, where are they? I have never seen one. However, famous historical figures tend to have legendary narratives. For example, Wen Tianxiang, literally heavenly auspiciousness, a scholar general of the Southern Song Dynasty, was so named because auspicious signs appeared in the heavens upon his birth. 
There are many similar legends about famous figures, so it is understandable that when the Buddha was born, hundreds of flowers bloomed, filling the air with their fragrance as a sign of celebration. Among the many legends surrounding the Buddha's birth was that he pointed one hand to the sky and one hand to the earth, declaring, I am the uniquely honored one in the world. The true meaning of this phrase should be, the Buddha is the uniquely honored one in the world. As all beings intrinsically possess a noble Buddha nature, they are thus like the Buddha. This is the truth that the Buddha realized. As the verse goes, in the heaven above and the earth below, none is like the Buddha. It is the same in the worlds of the ten directions. Of all that I have seen in the entire world, none can be compared to the Buddha. Some conceited monks believe that I am the uniquely honored one to mean only I am the best. They even claim that the Buddha himself said it. This is an offense to the Buddha as he was a most modest and dutiful sage who would not utter such conceit. So, I wonder, who heard the Buddha say this? The goal of humanistic Buddhism is to return to the original intents of the Buddha. Beliefs that are inappropriate, incorrect, deified, superstitious, or concern deities and ghosts should be separated from the Buddha of the human world. The greatest virtue of the humanistic Buddha is in his teachings. As said in the Buddhist sutras, one should rely on the self, rely on the Dharma, and rely on nothing else. The Buddha never boasted. Instead, he encouraged people to rely on themselves. Since all beings possess the Buddha nature, everyone can attain Buddhahood. Other than the Dharma, there is nothing else to rely on. Since writing the biography of Sakyamuni Buddha and being a monk for over 80 years, I have gotten a better understanding of the Buddha's life. People should relinquish superstitious and supernatural views on the Buddha, including dressing him up as a fortune teller. The Buddha has endured this burden long enough. End of chapter 39。Chapter 40 Ten Names of the Tathagata When a child is born, parents usually seek the advice of the wise and virtuous for an auspicious name. Likewise, when the Buddha was born, his father, King Suddhodana, also consulted a sage and named him Siddhartha, meaning, he who fulfills his aim. Upon enlightenment, the Buddha became the great awakened and wise one, which was a tremendous accomplishment compared to ordinary people. With due respect, the later generations of his disciples honored him with ten epithets, which are collectively known as the ten names of the Tathagata. This is similar to an honor bestowed by an emperor through the title National Teacher to monastics who had made exemplary contributions to the country. The ten names of the Tathagata are Number one, thus come one, Tathagata. Number two, worthy one. Number three, truly all-knowing one. Number four, one perfect in knowledge and conduct. Number five, well-gone one. Number six, 
Knower of the world. Number seven, unsurpassed one. Number eight, great tamer. Number nine, teacher of heavenly and human beings. Number ten, awakened one and world honored one. For example, number one, thus come one, represents the Buddha's emergence from true thusness to deliver all beings in this human world. Number two, worthy one signifies the Buddha's grace in accepting offerings from humans and heavenly beings due to his perfection of wisdom and virtue. Number three, truly all-knowing one implies the Buddha's complete and flawless knowledge of all worldly phenomena. Number four, one perfect in knowledge and conduct emphasizes the Buddha's exemplary wholesome conduct and supernatural knowledge. Number five, well gone one conveys the Buddha's attainment of Buddhahood by severing all defilements with infinite wisdom. Number six, knower of the world means that there is nothing in this world unknown to the Buddha. Number seven, unsurpassed one expresses that the Buddha has surpassed all beings and is peerless. Number eight, great tamer denotes the Buddha's skillful means of teaching and taming all stubborn and attached beings. Number nine, teacher of heavenly and human beings asserts that the Buddha is the teacher of all human and heavenly beings. Number 10, awakened one and world honored one designate the Buddha as an awakened sage, the most honorable and unsurpassed in both mundane and supramundane worlds. However, do the above 10 names of Tathagata truly praise the Buddha? Are they able to convey the Buddha's character and integrity? Are these titles universal and well known? Other than thus come one, Tathagata, used by most Buddhists, the rest are largely unknown. Few refer to the Buddha as the worthy one. It is unusual to say, we are paying respect to the worthy one, or we are offering flowers to the worthy one. Likewise, no one says, we go to the temple to pay respects to the truly all-knowing one, the one perfect in knowledge and conduct, the well-gone one, the knower of the world. Even fewer people know the names unsurpassed one or great tamer. Thus, it is clear that these 10 names of the Buddha no longer feature in everyday speech. So, what then is the purpose of these 10 names? Rather than retaining so many different epithets, Buddha should be the only name used. Like a preferred name used instead of a given name, one can still refer to the Buddha as the Great Awakened One, the Great Wise One, and the Perfect One as a sign of respect. However, overall, it is preferable to use the name Buddha. Buddhists have already gradually reached a consensus on referring to the Buddha as the Buddha. Therefore, one should hold true to the original meaning of the Buddha, rather than presumptuously addressing the Buddha with unbefitting and uncommon titles. End of chapter 40.
Chapter 41 Honoured One Among Two-Legged Beings When taking refuge in the Triple Gem, one recites, I take refuge in the Buddha, the Honoured One Among Two-Legged Beings. A habitual devotee may not understand what this means. Why would the Buddha want us to take refuge in him and praise him as the honoured one among two-legged beings? This term has a very profound meaning and significance. Firstly, the Buddha has already perfected the two pillars of cultivation, merit and wisdom. As recorded in the sutras, it takes three incalculable kalpas to perfect wisdom and merit, and 100 kalpas to perfect the supreme marks. As the Buddha already perfected his cultivations of both merit and wisdom, is he then not the most honorable one? Regarding merit and wisdom, Buddhism has a saying, Cultivating merit without developing wisdom one is reborn as an elephant adorned with jewels. Developing wisdom without cultivating merit, one becomes an arhat who rarely receives offerings. A Buddhist practitioner should not only emphasize understanding and practice, but also cultivate both merit and wisdom. Merit and wisdom are like the two wings of a bird neither one is expendable. Merit needs to be guided by wisdom, and the accumulation of wisdom depends on merit. Hence, sutras often reiterate that one must cultivate both merit and wisdom for fruitful results in one's practice. If one seeks rebirth in the Western Pure Land, then one cannot lack wholesome roots and meritorious conditions. There is no special way to attain Buddhahood but through cultivating both merit and wisdom. As such, the Buddha is revered as the honoured one among two-legged beings because he has perfected both merit and wisdom, the two legs of cultivation. Moreover, among living beings, whether two-legged, four-legged, ten-legged, hundred-legged, and even legless, humans are most honoured of all, for only human beings can stand upright with the top of their heads supporting the sky and their feet firmly on the ground. In contrast, all other beings can only have their backs facing the sky instead of their heads. Buddhahood is attained by human beings. It was in this world that the Buddha was born, cultivated, and attained awakening. The truth expounded by the Buddha can liberate sentient beings from suffering. Therefore, among all two-legged human beings, Buddha is the most honorable one. Hence, when paying respect to the Buddha, one recites, I take refuge in the Buddha, the honoured one among two-legged beings. Just like the Buddha, humans are two-legged. If one realises this and is aware that the self is honourable and dignified, then one will be confident that the cultivation of merit and wisdom can be perfected. In this way, everyone is also the most honoured among two-legged beings. End of chapter 41。Chapter 42。Amitabha。Buddha. Omi Dofo, 
the Chinese pronunciation of Amitabha Buddha, has become a common expression among Buddhists and non-Buddhists alike. Sometimes it is used as a greeting. Omitofo. Also, it can be said congratulatorily to someone newly promoted. It can also be said empathetically to a person gone bankrupt, or when someone slips and falls. Omitofo. Are you hurt? Moreover, it is an expression of gratitude when a person receives a gift. Omitofo. Thank you. For people awkward at expressing themselves, a simple omitofo suffices to convey their heartfelt thoughts. In the whole universe, there is no phrase better or more meaningful than omitofo. No phrase has such wide acceptance. However, many people do not fully understand the significance of Omitofo. Omitofo is the Chinese transliteration of the Sanskrit name Amitabha Buddha, which means infinite light and infinite life. It represents the transcendence of time and space, the eternity of life and truth, and the infinity of strength. It also expresses the dual cultivation of merit and wisdom, as well as liberation from birth and death. Once there was a young man who attended a Dharma talk. The old monk was explaining that one will accumulate immense merit and virtue by reciting the Buddha's name. He was most displeased and said, Old monk, how is it possible that chanting a simple two-word Amitabha Buddha can lead to awakening, eliminate disasters, and increase one's blessing? When the old monk heard this absurd question, he shouted curtly, Idiot! The young man grew angry and said, You are a monastic. How dare you curse at people? The old monk replied calmly, Idiot is just one word, yet you responded so fiercely to it. Amitabha Buddha contains two words, so, of course, its merit and virtue are even greater. When one chants the Buddha's name, one remedies deviant thoughts with right thought, then progresses from right thought to no thought. The result of this practice is what is meant by the saying, The mind has the Buddha, so recite Buddha with the mind. Recite until the mind is empty, and thus true attainment gained. Reciting Amitabha Buddha is not exclusive to Pure Land practitioners or those seeking rebirth in the Western Pure Land of ultimate bliss. The greatly virtuous name Amitabha Buddha is filled with infinite merit and virtue. This name is just like the concept of emptiness, which encompasses infinite meanings. Let us imagine that your name is John Smith, and people are always calling you John Smith. What is John Smith? This John Smith does not necessarily have any direct relation with you. However, if a person were to say Omitofo to you, then you can be the same as Amitabha Buddha. You can resonate and be one with the concept of emptiness. Thus the name Amitabha Buddha is of great benefit and significance to you. In the past, there was a layman named Shimpei who was a pious devotee of the Pure Land belief and practiced diligently. Day and night, he would always recite Omitofo. Unfortunately, 
Though this layman was very respectful of Buddhism and a firm believer, his wisdom never grew. When Zen master Sangai learned of his situation, he wanted to give him an extra boost. One day, Shinpei went to the temple to prostrate to the Buddha. When Sangai saw him, he said, Mr. Shinpei. Shinpei saw the Zen master and promptly answered, Omitofo. Sangai called him again, Mr. Shinpei. Shinpei replied again, Omitofo. Sangai called again, Mr. Shinpei. At this point, Shinpei was confused, but he replied, Omitofo. Sangai then asked, Everything you say has Omitofo in it. Don't you think you're bothering Amitabha Buddha too much? Shinpei replied, Omitofo. I am a person who practices the recitation of the Buddha's name, so, of course, the name of the Buddha never leaves my mouth and mind. Omitofo replied Sangai and walked away. Sangai intended to tell Shinpei that one cannot depend solely on Amitabha Buddha in spiritual practice. If one plants Amitabha Buddha firmly in one's mind and becomes like Amitabha Buddha, is this not better? That is why I often say that the true recitation of the Buddha's name is to recite without the thought of reciting, to not recite, yet still be reciting. Reciting the Buddha's name also requires one to take responsibility for oneself. Furthermore, in addition to reciting the Buddha's name, one should learn from the Buddha's teachings, follow the Buddha's footsteps, and serve the community. The true meaning of reciting Amitabha Buddha is to follow the example of Amitabha Buddha's 48 great vows, for each vow is the compassion and wisdom to liberate sentient beings. End of chapter 42Chapter 43 Human Deification Every country has some form of local belief in gods or deities, known as folk religions. Moreover, these communities also believe in some international or global religion, known as world religions. World religions are not bound to a single country or community. They are global. Thus the concept, religion without borders. Currently, world religions include Buddhism, Catholicism, Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Taoism, and Confucianism. To be known as a world religion, it needs to first be recognized and accepted worldwide. On the other hand, cults that stem from other religions cannot sustain themselves for long. Sooner or later, they scatter and collapse. The belief of most folk religions surrounds a god or a deity. Some people even believe in immortals, fox spirits, ghosts, and monsters, but none of these are widely recognized and are arguably the creation of a numbered few to fulfill the needs of humanity. For example, a dispute arose and the police were called to mediate between both parties. However, 
one party felt a lack of justice in the mediator. So, he built a temple for Tudigong, god of earth, to preside over the mediation. For this person, Tudigong represents the police station, and the deity himself will rule with justice. Or, for those who lost in court cases and felt wronged, they would build a temple for Cheng Huang Shen, God of a city, for the just and unbiased Cheng Huang Shen will oversee the ruling. It can be inferred from these examples that people can devise their own religions based on their needs. For example, farmers believe in Shen Nong, the god of agriculture. Constructors believe in Lu Ban, the patron god of builders. And businessmen believe in Guan Gong, the god of wealth. The deification and worship of many divine beings began this way. Some people worship natural phenomena, thus lightning, thunder, clouds, and rainfall became the deities they revere and fear. Some worship nature, believing in mountains, rivers, and the earth. In some cases, people build ancestral shrines to commemorate great emperors or heroes of the past. Even ordinary citizens who made small contributions to an area are deified and worshipped by locals as an expression of gratitude. Therefore, rather than the gods creating the world as believed by many religions, it could be said that it is human beings who created the gods. However, righteous Buddhist belief is different. Sakyamuni Buddha, the founder of Buddhism, is not a god, but a human being. He was born in Kapilavastu, India, and his parents were King Sudodana and Queen Maya. There are historical records of his life in the royal palace, including his practice of austerities. After many years of diligent spiritual cultivation and austerities, he awakened to the truth. Being completely awakened, his mind is as vast as the universe, and his lifespan as immeasurable as time. Transcending time and space, the Buddha teaches sentient beings with exceptional ease and awakening. The Buddha differs from a deity in that he cannot grant wishes. However, he teaches the true Dharma of causes, conditions, and effects. The Buddha has no power to punish. He teaches that each is responsible for their actions. He is an awakened being, a sage that transcends all religions and deities. He transforms and educates humans with true Dharma, instead of granting safety, happiness, wealth, and honor. Buddhist faith, in a traditional sense, means to respect the Buddha and believe in his virtues, existence, and the benefits of his teachings. Today's humanistic Buddhism is no different. Therefore, if one believes in Buddhism, then one must return to the original intents of the Buddha. The Buddha did not create humanity, and neither did humans create the Buddha. Everyone is subject to the consequences of their actions, and the responsibility of cause and effect lies in no other. As the teaching says, Rely on the self, rely on the Dharma, and rely on nothing else. 
This is the highest principle of faith in Buddhism. End of chapter 43。Chapter 44, Six Points of Reverent Harmony。From the dawn of time, wise sages have emphasized the importance of interpersonal harmony. For example, Confucianism advocated that peace is priceless, harmony leads to auspiciousness, peaceful and pleasant countenance, and peaceful coexistence without going with the flow. In Buddhism, it is often said that a monastery prospers when there are no disputes. Conflicts can be avoided when interpersonal harmony is achieved. The six points of reverent harmony are practiced by the Sangha to maintain harmony, facilitate interaction, and conduct daily affairs. Hence, monastics are also known as He Shang. Most venerable. He refers to harmony and Shang to venerate. In other words, He Shang is one who venerates peace and harmony. Buddhist monastics are required to follow the Dharma in all aspects of life and abide by the six points of reverent harmony. This includes their interactions views, daily affairs, and spiritual cultivation. Due to this consensus and practice, the Sangha can live together in joy and harmony without disputes. Harmony refers to being harmonious in principles and in practice. In other words, monastics live in harmony by sharing the same understanding of the truth and the way daily affairs are conducted. The six points of reverent harmony are Number 1. Harmony in view through shared understanding. This means unity in ideology and to have a consensus in understanding. If there is discord in views, it will be difficult to live and work together. Hence, there should be harmony and consensus established in view. Number 2. Moral harmony through sharing the same precepts. This means the equality of rules. Everyone should abide by the same sets of precepts and rules without exception. No one has special privileges. In other words, Everyone is equal before the law. Number 3. Economic harmony through equal sharing. This means equal economic sharing, where all living necessities are equally distributed among the members of the Sangha. There is no discrimination based on position or ranking. Hence, Everyone has equal rights. Number 4. Mental harmony through shared happiness. This means the harmony of intentions. One should be polite, have good etiquette, be well-mannered, harmonious, and respectful to one another when living in a community. Number 5. Verbal harmony through avoiding disputes. This means joy through words. There are no arguments or disputes. All conversations are spoken only in the language of a Buddhist monastery. For example, May I inquire your Dharma name, Venerable? Please give a Dharma talk, Elder Venerable. 
I, a student, dare not accept this honor. Your humble student is filled with afflictions and requests for your guidance. Where there is Dharma, there is no conflict. Number six, physical harmony through living together. This means a stable and joyful living environment. A temple is a community where everyone lives together. Since everyone has chosen a path of spiritual cultivation for joy, everyone should live together with a joyful heart. Within the six points of reverent harmony, harmony in view, moral harmony, and economic harmony form the essence of harmony. Mental harmony, verbal harmony, and physical harmony are its actualization. Harmony is truly wonderful. For example, people wear clothes with different colors, but if the colors are in harmony, one naturally looks elegant. The five senses may look different from one another, but when these features are in harmony, one naturally looks beautiful. The body's internal organs have different functions, but when they work together harmoniously, one is naturally healthy. Joy and tranquility are achieved because the Sangha community adheres to the six points of reverent harmony. Likewise, a family that practices these will also be happy and free from strife. A team that follows these maximizes their teamwork potential. A society that practices the six is peaceful, joyful, and beneficial. A country that realizes these is prosperous, healthy, buoyant, and organized. Ultimately, the six points of reverent harmony are known as the six ways to build a harmonious world. If everyone practices accordingly, society will naturally be free from conflict, and countries will naturally be stable and prosperous. End of chapter 44。Chapter 45 Field of Merit Ancient China was an agricultural society where people made a living by planting crops and harvesting them. In a sense, replacing hunting and gathering with agriculture made great strides in terms of human morality. When cultivating fields, one knows that fertile fields yield good harvests, whereas barren fields yield poor harvests. In this way, wealthy families of the past made their riches through harvesting thousands of acres of fertile land. Likewise, in Buddhism, the field represents the mind where one harvests what one is willing to sow. Buddhist monastics are generally referred to as fields of merit. In other words, monastics pure in virtue and practice are considered worthy of receiving offerings from humans and heavenly beings. Those who offer to the Sangha would receive great merit. Moreover, the kasaya worn by monastics is called the merit field robe. It is patched to look like sections of croplands, the analogy being that monastics nourish their physical bodies through the offerings of devotees. Lay practitioners, in turn, develop their wisdom through receiving teachings of Dharma from the monastics. Together, the Sangha and laity help one another to accomplish the cultivation of merit and virtue. 
Buddhism often teaches the dual cultivation of merit and wisdom, that is, to emphasize both understanding and practice. Understanding refers to studying the teachings and history of the different Buddhist schools and sects. Practice refers to spiritual cultivation, such as chanting the Buddha's name, meditation, and prostrating to the Buddha. By cultivating merit and wisdom through understanding and practice, one nourishes the mind by planting seeds in one's field of merit. According to the sutras, eight kinds of people are considered as fields of merit. Buddhas, sages, monastics, upadhyaya, preceptors, akarya, teachers, fathers, mothers, and the sick. Having faith in the Triple Gem, taking care of one's parents, respecting one's teachers, being a good friend, praising others and speaking no evil are all meritorious actions. However, a Buddhist saying states that among the eight fields of merit, the best is to visit the sick which stresses the importance of caring for those suffering from illness. As such, impoverished children and people struggling in remote areas deserve help. One should also care for orphans and hospital patients in pain. All these are examples of cultivating the field of merit. Spiritual cultivation does not necessarily mean making a pilgrimage to a faraway temple or offer incense. Actually, every person is a field of merit. Simply put, in helping and benefiting others, everyone in society becomes a field in which merit is cultivated. In the past, when devotees would donate to Foguan Shan, some would ask out of jealousy, why keep giving to Foguan Shan and not to us? One devotee answered, it is difficult for us to earn our money. Donating is like planting in a field of merit. Therefore, the value of the harvest will depend on the investment. Monastics in a Buddhist temple cultivate their field of merit by propagating the Dharma to benefit people and serve society. By following and supporting them, we also plant in our own field of merit. One who seeks merit should begin by developing good affinities. As the saying goes, before one learns the Buddha's way, one must first form affinities with others. The broader one's affinities, the more is reaped from one's fields. This way, success is found no matter what you do. To reap a bountiful harvest, seeds must not be sown on the road or buried in weeds, as they will not grow. Only by choosing a fertile field for sowing will one reap a good harvest. Likewise, the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha are all excellent fields of merit to choose from. End of chapter 45。Chapter 46 Empowerment and deliverance. Most Buddhists chant sutras and prostrate to the Buddhas in the hopes of receiving the empowerment of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Empowerment refers to spiritual strength and experience. One is empowered when one feels a sense 
of spiritual invigoration. For example, a child who is bullied is empowered through his mother's support and encouragement. In a temple, people are empowered when their fears are alleviated from prostrating to the Buddha and listening to the words of the wise. In the aftermath of a disaster, victims are empowered and their safety assured through the relief aid provided by the government. Likewise, sentient beings, who may be timid in nature and lacking in strength, rely on faith as well as empowerment through the strength, thoughts, compassion and spirit of others. When one prostrates to and has faith in the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, one is guided and empowered by them. The power of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas helps calm one's body and mind, strengthens one's faith and energy, and develops one's wisdom and ability to resolve difficulties. However, Buddhist devotees should not entreat to excess when prostrating to the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas in hopes of receiving a response or protection. The Buddhas and Bodhisattvas are neither the police nor prosecutors of the human world. They have transcended the mundane and do not involve themselves with reward or punishment nor do they execute the law. In this world, unwholesome deeds are subject to legal sanctions and are not matters that the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas can interfere with. The Buddhas and Bodhisattvas are embodiments of the truth and they will always accord with the truth rather than turn against it. Moreover, it is important to transform one's reliance from empowerment through others to self-empowerment. Faith, loving-kindness, compassion, wisdom, patience and cultivation are all ways of self-empowerment. In the sutras, all the teachings taught by the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas ultimately instruct practitioners to be self-reliant. One's karma, whether wholesome or unwholesome, good or evil, must be shouldered by oneself. The Buddhas and Bodhisattvas serve for guidance and direction. Therefore, after listening to the teachings, one should believe, accept and practice them. To rely solely on imploring rewards from the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas would be contrary to the law of cause and effect. One should have faith and accept the empowerment bestowed by the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. At the same time, one should not excessively request for protection so that it overrides cause and effect. Such would be a wrong understanding and an unsuitable request. End of chapter 46。Chapter 47 Four Dharma Realms In Buddhism, everything in the universe, whether principal, spiritual, or material, is categorized into Dharma realms, each having its name, function, and boundary. For instance, the six sense organs, six sense objects, and six consciousnesses are collectively known as the 18 realms. Similarly, in the Avantamsaka Sutra, the ways of observing the world 
are summarized into the four Dharma realms. Number one, realm of phenomena. Everything in the universe, including the sun and moon, yin and yang, mountains and rivers, is differentiated in terms of its boundaries. Mountains are not rivers. Likewise, you and I are not the same. As such, all phenomena are distinguished through their different characteristics. For instance, the eyes differ from the ears, and the ears differ from the nose. Tom is not Rick, and Rick is not Harry. Put simply, the realm of phenomena refers to observing the world through phenomenal appearances. Number 2. Realm of Principle Although everything in the universe is phenomenally different, they are of a single thusness in terms of the ultimate truth. The universe is entirely encompassed within the mind. Such is the commonality shared by all. Yet, while phenomena arise from dependent origination and are of one essence, they can still be distinguished by their unique characteristics and appearances. Likewise, everything has its own set of principles. People observe the principles of humanity. Celestial bodies follow the principles of heaven. Feelings arise according to emotional principles. Situations obey the principles of logic. And physical matter abide by the principles of physics. While each have their own set of rules and guidelines, they share a common origin. Thusness, our Buddha nature. Observing the world in this way is known as the realm of principle. Number 3. Realm of non-obstruction between principles and phenomena. Principles and phenomena interpenetrate and do not obstruct one another. In other words, principles are elucidated only through phenomena and phenomena are explained only through principles. For example, if one were to build a table without the principles of manufacturing, then the end product will not look like a table. Likewise, building a house without a blueprint will prove difficult. Therefore, principles and phenomena are interdependent. Phenomena demonstrate principles, and principles are found in phenomena. This is known as the realm of non-obstruction between principles and phenomena. Number 4. Realm of non-obstruction between all phenomena. The myriad phenomena, matter, and objects in this world have different aspects but they are of the same essence, neither contradicting nor conflicting with one another. All phenomena are completely interpenetrative. Hence, there is no need to discriminate one from the other, this from that, or east from the west. Just as Confucianism teaches the oneness of the heavens, the earth, and people, Buddhism further elaborates and explains that all Dharma realms are dependent in origination. One and many are not different. Large and small are mutually interfused. All phenomena reflect upon one another in multi-layered inexhaustibility. Such is the realm of non-obstruction between all phenomena. The four Dharma realms, as explained in the Avatamsaka Sutra, provide one with a correct understanding of the universe, that all dharmas originate from the mind. 
it teaches to let go of attachment, prejudice, opposition, and conflict amid myriad phenomena and a delusive world. Instead, one should observe all principles and phenomena through dependent origination, equality, and harmony. Doing so would be in accord with the fundamental meaning of the four Dharma realms as taught in the Avatamsaka Sutra. End of chapter 47Chapter 48 One is Many Within the realm of non-obstruction between phenomena, one of the four Dharma realms taught in the Avantamsaka Sutra, there are no obstructions between principles and phenomena, self and other, or one and many. From the Huayan perspective, one is not necessarily less, and neither is a billion many. One is one, but can also be considered many. Many are many, but can also be considered as one. One and many are non-dualistic. Hence, one is many, many are one. Take a piece of chalk as an example. When used to write on a classroom blackboard, it produces dust that drifts in all directions. Each speck of dust is so small it is barely noticeable, but every speck originates from that piece of chalk, the product of a laborious process of manufacturing and packaging before it is sold in stores. Therefore, a speck of dust is not merely one, but a combination of many causes, conditions, and forces that brought it into being. Another example. I am here as one person in one classroom, situated in one college and going further, located in one Taiwan, on one earth, in one emptiness. And yet, if one speck of dust were to be compared to one emptiness, which would be greater? What is the definition of great and small? Is one many, or is many many? In this way, a speck of dust can contain a tri chiliocosm, illustrating the concept of one is many. Likewise, a tri chiliocosm can also be considered one, yet neither decreasing in amount nor size. Hence, the perspective of the universe and life in Mahayana Buddhism differs from what most people know and observe with a discriminating mind. Dichotomous and discriminating views, self and other, large and small, superior and inferior, rich and poor, create discord, fear and afflictions in this world. All these can be prevented by understanding the idea that there is me in you and you in me, and unifying the concepts of one and many, many and less, self and other, and right and wrong. In this way, what reason is left for conflict or revenge? Everyone in this world is connected to each other. People come together when conditions arise and separate when conditions disperse. 
as conditions continuously arise and cease, there is no need to quarrel over right or wrong, good or evil. Buddhist practitioners should learn to see the entire tri-chiliocosm from a speck of dust. As the saying goes, the Buddha sees that a grain of rice is as enormous as Mount Sumeru. How can a grain of rice be compared to Mount Sumeru? However, from another perspective, a grain of rice comes from the vendor who sold it and the farmer who planted it. It took the combined effort of heaven and earth to make this grain of rice. Prior to this, the grain of rice was nourished by the earth and the sky, the sun and moon, sunshine and rainfall for irrigation. Heaven and earth have come together to produce this grain of rice. Hence, the combined causes and conditions of a grain of rice equals the might of Mount Sumeru. As such, small is said to be great, one is exactly many. Knowing this, there is no need to be discriminatory or opposed towards others. Embracing what is different allows one's heart to be magnanimous and widens one's horizons. Naturally, one's success will also be greater. The following phrase is found during the recitation of a Wenshu report during a Dharma service. A mind that embraces the vast emptiness and a heart boundless as myriad worlds. Simply put, expand one's heart so that it eclipses the vast emptiness. By including the whole universe and all Dharma realms in one's heart, then it is as vast as the universe and all Dharma realms. Only by encompassing all can one's heart truly be boundless as myriad worlds. Cultivation in humanistic Buddhism focuses not on the mystical, but on one's magnanimity and patience in dealing with people in everyday life. Can one understand that everything in this universe exists together because of causes and conditions, and therefore everything is interrelated? If so, then one must be thankful for the causes and conditions that make one who they are today. Do not waste causes and conditions. Cherish, seize, and create them for oneself and others. These are the essential practices of Buddhism. End of chapter 48Chapter 49 Dharma Abode Most people take printed sutras or established principles as the only form of Dharma. Some even believe that expounding the sutras is the only way to propagate the Buddha's teachings. But where is the Dharma? If it is in the sutra repository, then the Dharma is out of reach to the hearts of the people. If it is in the heart of an eminent master, then the Dharma is hidden from us. If it is in the mountainous temples, then the Dharma is inaccessible. Where then is the Dharma? The Dharma is found in the vast emptiness of this world. All worldly phenomena are the Dharma. As the saying goes, 
Lush green bamboo are wondrous truths. The luxuriant yellow flower is nothing but prajna. All life and vitality are said to be the Dharma. The Dharma in all its forms is the teachings of the Buddha, liberating one from defilement, suffering, while increasing one's wisdom and self-reliance. Therefore, the Buddha teaches one to rely on the self, rely on the Dharma, and rely on nothing else. When one takes refuge in the Triple Gem and upholds the Five Precepts, the Triple Gem and the Five Precepts are the Dharma. The Dharma should not be viewed as an abstract ideology, but rather as the vast and formless truth. The Dharma has many layers. The mundane world has worldly teachings, and the supramundane world has transcendental teachings. Likewise, lay practitioners have lay teachings, and monastics have teachings specific to the Sangha. The precepts can be likened to the law, and every line in the sutras likened to a teacher. As such, they are all embodiments of the Dharma. The term Dharma abode likens the Dharma to a home where one lives. Of course, one can live in a villa, a skyscraper, or an apartment, but the Dharma is not in these places. As the Buddhist saying goes, the three realms are like a burning house. Living in a world filled with the five desires and six dusts is like living in a burning house, for one cannot attain enlightenment. Therefore, one must abide in the Dharma. A person with faith lives with faith as their abode. A person who chants the sutras lives with chanting the sutras as their abode. Therefore, Dharma abode means to take the Dharma as one's home. One lives in the Dharma and takes it as one's house. Often, it is difficult to see the direct connections to one's life when discussing the importance of the Dharma. However, using a home as a metaphor immediately illustrates its significance. Like how a single dollar can be used to purchase bread and relieve hunger, having a mere slice of the infinite, limitless, and immeasurable Dharma can still bring numerous benefits. It is just as the saying, whether a house is made of silver or gold, it is still not as good as one's humble abode. Even if one applies and practices only a single aspect of the six perfections, generosity, precepts, patience, diligence, meditative concentration, and prajna wisdom, one can still be liberated. For example, if you can converse with others using kind and compassionate words, look upon each other with kind and compassionate eyes, greet each other with warmth and compassion, assist others using kind and compassionate hands, and wish others the very best with a caring and compassionate mind, you are applying the Dharma in its myriad forms and will attain self-mastery of the Dharma. The Dharma is one's home sweet home. The spirit of taking the Dharma as one's home is to view the Dharma as where one resides and is nurtured. Doing so would be the meaning of Dharma abode.
End of chapter 49. Chapter 50 Awakening In life, there are many mysteries leading to unanswered questions and confusion. Imagine if one were awakened and all-knowing. Would not the attainment of Buddhahood then be possible? For this reason, Chan masters of the past only pursued enlightenment, not Buddhahood. Many think that awakening is a rather mysterious and difficult matter, but awakening can occur on many levels. For example, the acquirement of knowledge that leads to certain levels of understanding can be regarded as a type of awakening. In Buddhism, it is believed that small questions lead to small awakenings. Major questions lead to major awakenings, while no questions lead to no awakening. Therefore, it is important to inquire and to question. Only with questions can one become wiser and inspired. Only from questions comes solutions and realization. This is what awakening is about. Inventions and discoveries by scientists, such as the light bulb by Thomas Edison, the airplane by the Wright brothers, gravity by Isaac Newton, and electricity by Benjamin Franklin are all types of awakening. However, these are merely awakening to phenomena that gave rise to worldly knowledge and theory. They are unlike the great awakening of Chan masters, who were awakened to the answers of the questions, where does life begin, and where will one go after death? Once practitioners attain awakening, recollection of memories, no matter how far into the past, would come to them. Thus, to the awakened mind, time-wise, all matters from the past, present, or future are all within a moment of thought. Space-wise, all matters from the ten directions, such as north, east, south, west, are all inside the practitioner's mind. In a single present moment, the entire multiverse is within the practitioner's grasp. Su Dongpo, a Song Dynasty poet, once composed three poems that describe the three phases of Chan and awakening. The first phase, before practicing Chan, a range from across but a peak from the side, far, near, high and low, each of you by sight. Why has one failed to see Mount Lu's real face? All only because right inside Mount Lu he is. This refers to the state where a mountain is a mountain, Water is water, which is deluded understanding by the discriminating mind. The second phase, before awakening, after practicing Chan. Misty rains of Mount Lu and tides in Zhejiang. Unless really there, a thousand resentments will linger. Having finally arrived, everything seemed purposeless. Still the misty rains of Mount Lu. Still the tides in Zhejiang. This refers to the state where 
A mountain is no longer a mountain, and water is no longer water. The mountains and water no longer look as they did now that one sees with wisdom. The third phase, after awakening. The babbling creeks are his broad, long tongue. The scenic mountains are none but his pure body. Nightfall brings 84,000 garters. In the days ahead, how should such be presented to all? After eradicating attachment to greed and desire, one now sees that a mountain is still a mountain, and water is still water. The mountains and water that one observes come from the spring of wisdom that flows from the mind. Therefore, one now views everything with an ordinary mind. Be it a monastic or lay practitioner, one need not seek the eradication of calamity or adversity. Instead, one should seek to become awakened. Likened to the state of drunkenness to escape reality is the state of ignorance. Akin to the great illumination of the universe is the state of awakening. Buddhists prostrate to the Buddha in search of awakening. In the same way, they recite the Buddha's name in search of awakening. Do good in search of awakening, and practice Chan in search of awakening. From this, to Buddhists, awakening is hope, while ignorance is suffering. Having been ignorant life after life, one has failed to transcend rebirth. However, once awakened, be it life or death, one will face everything with clarity of mind. Huinong, the sixth Chan patriarch, may have been illiterate, yet he became awakened. When Tai Shu went into a retreat aged 19, he had never been to school, yet became awakened. In the same way, there are many Buddhists today who have become awakened. They just choose not to reveal it. Unlike in the past, the Buddha was able to recognize any awakened mind by just hearing them speak or connecting spiritually. But today, there is no true witness to anyone's awakening. Buddhist practitioners today need not regard awakening as an impossible task. If one's spiritual cultivation continues, virtue and attainment will arise. Consequently, awakening is thus possible. End of chapter 50「Chapter 51 」Rely on the self, rely on the Dharma Often, people state that Buddhism is great. However, in what way is Buddhism great? Undoubtedly, with a long history, rich culture, and a considerable number of followers, Buddhism has become a universal faith. Moreover, the fact that the Buddhist teachings are suitable for both monastics and laity, its non-interference in national politics but focus on education, and its support for social order and stability 
by enhancing moral and ethical values, Buddhism is therefore considered to be great. However, the true greatness of Buddhism lies in its doctrines and teachings. As said in the Agamas, rely on the self, rely on the Dharma, and rely on nothing else. Should these words be taken lightly without true understanding, the greatness of Buddhism is unattainable. Even the Buddha did not hold himself in greatness. Instead, he said that it is the Dharma which is greatest. The Buddha believed that one must rely on the Dharma to attain Buddhahood. It is because of the Dharma that there is the Buddha and the Sangha. As the saying goes, the offering of Dharma excels all forms of offering. Even the Buddha relied on the Dharma for his cultivation. The Buddha expounded many teachings elucidating the truth of the universe and life. For example, dependent origination and the middle path. True thusness is one's intrinsic nature. Cause and effect and karmic retribution. The three realms are creations of the mind. Myriad phenomena are creations of the consciousness, and the non-duality of emptiness and existence. However, I believe the teaching which most impacted my understanding of the importance of the Buddha's realization on this universe and the meaning of self-discovery is his final reflection before entering Parinirvana. Rely on the self, rely on the Dharma. What is the meaning of relying on the self? The Buddha never asked people to conform to him, nor follow him or emulate him. Instead, he taught people to rediscover their original intrinsic nature that is free and true. The Buddha taught people to rely on the self by taking refuge in oneself, by trusting, improving, and transcending oneself. This is the heartfelt intention of the Buddha. In addition to relying on the self, one should also rely on the Dharma. The Buddha never proclaimed that he was the greatest in this world. What he believed in was that the Dharma and the truth are the greatest, and that it is what one should take refuge in. In Buddhism, it is important to rely on the Dharma and not on individuals. If Buddhists know to rely on the self and rely on the Dharma, then they will be able to improve and transcend. Moreover, they will truly understand the truth of the universe and life, and acquire clarity on one's future direction. It is a pity that people do not realize their great potential and are unwilling to improve. Some are lured by money and others dominated by love. Some are governed by the six sense objects, sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, and dharmas while others are driven by the five desires – wealth, sensual pleasures, fame, food, and sleep. Reliance on such mundane matters brings only constraint, not liberation. Vain are worldly fame and wealth. Like fleeting clouds in the sky, they cannot be relied upon as 
in the end, one will be left with nothing. Furthermore, some people rely on divine power, thereby constraining themselves and making liberation impossible. To truly follow the Buddha's teachings, one must take refuge in oneself. For example, if one wishes to attain liberation, self-reliance is required, not divine or external powers. Likewise, to practice compassion and loving-kindness, one must have prajna wisdom. To awaken to the way, one must connect with the truth of the world. The way has no past and present, for awakening is in the present moment. By affirming that one is the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, one becomes a paragon of truth, an embodiment of truth and an example of truth. In this way, self-improvement does not rely on divine intervention or superstitious practice as they do not lead to liberation. Furthermore, one does not rely on the Buddha for any benefits, for the greatest benefit he has given all beings is the path towards self-liberation. Rely on the self, rely on the Dharma. How amazed I am by the infinite truth found in the Buddha's teachings. Such teaching is paramount in exerting, transcending, and liberating ourselves. In this modern world, People are oppressed by wars and politics, as well as confusion on superstition and divine power, to the extent they cannot see the light in their future. If one can fully understand the importance of rely on the self, rely on the Dharma, and practice accordingly, one will find significant distinctions from other Buddhist truths such as the law of cause and effect, karma, dependent origination, the middle path, and the inherent self. End of chapter 51 Chapter 52 Dedication of Merit In Buddhist monasteries, morning and evening chanting always conclude with a verse of taking refuge in the triple gem and a dedication of merit. Formal Buddhist meals are also ended with a dedication of merit for breakfast and lunch. Buddhist funerals include a dedication of merit for the deceased, and prayer ceremonies also culminate with a dedication for the living. Why do the daily activities in Buddhist monasteries conclude with a dedication of merit? What is its significance? To dedicate means to deposit. Just as people deposit money in a bank for safekeeping. When a meritorious deed is done, one hopes that it can bring their parents and family good health and peace. This is the significance of dedicating merit. The dedication of merit is like sowing seeds. When one nurtures a seed with care, it will sprout, bloom, and bear many fruits. 
In this way, a small cause can contribute to a fruitful result. To dedicate merit is also like lighting a candle with another. The candle loses nothing by lighting another, instead becomes even brighter. Dedication of merit also reflects one's magnanimity, in which one wishes that glory goes to the Buddha, success goes to the multitude, benefit goes to the monastery, merit goes to the devotees. It also encompasses many meanings, including Number 1. A dedication of the lesser towards the greater. Number 2. A dedication from oneself towards others. Number 3. A dedication of phenomena towards principle. Number 4. A dedication of causes towards effects. And number 5. A dedication from existence towards emptiness. What is meant by a dedication of the lesser towards the greater? For example, when one offers a small piece of bread, one dedicates it universally to all beings, wishing that all beings are adequately provided for. Or, when one donates $10 to establishing a university, one can dedicate it universally, wishing that all students can excel in their studies. A small piece of bread, or $10, might seem insignificant, but through dedication, the merit is received by all. A dedication from oneself towards others is like dedicating merit to one's parents for their longevity after chanting and paying homage to the Buddha. It is also like dedicating merit to one's children so they may gain wisdom after a donation for the cause of printing sutras. Its significance is to benefit both oneself and others. What is a dedication of phenomena towards principle? Take the example of vowing to be a glass of water to quench people's thirst, vowing to be a path for others to travel with ease, vowing to be a tree that provides shade for others, vowing to be a filial child to one's parents so they are content and happy, or vowing to be a good parent to be a role model for one's children. From a phenomenal standpoint, these acts may seem trivial, but since the mind is infinitely magnanimous, it can be dedicated universally in principle. What is a dedication of causes towards effects? All present actions are considered to be at a causal stage. However, present causes come into fruition as future effects. Just as seeds sown in the spring produce a harvest in autumn, one reaps what has previously been sown. Good causes and conditions planted in this lifetime turn into good future outcomes, which is dedicating a cause to its effect. Lastly, there is a dedication from existence towards emptiness. Merit is usually dedicated towards something specific but this also restricts its possibilities. By transforming the limited 
into the limitless, one dedicates the existent towards emptiness. Just as the vast space encompasses all phenomena, one overcomes all suffering by realizing the emptiness of the five aggregates. All forms can be seen as formless, and all conditioned phenomena as unconditioned. Similarly, one's state of mind should be as vast as space, as boundless as the Dharma realm, when dedicating merit. The practice of dedicating one's merit can always be cultivated in daily life. Even the mere thought of goodwill and the smallest good deed can be dedicated. By doing what one's abilities allow and dedicating the merit towards others, a tiny drop of water can become a mighty ocean, and the weakest candle flare can illuminate a room. Dedicating one's merits is an act of selfless giving. If practiced by all, it will surely lead to a harmonious and joyful human world. End of chapter 52。Thank you for listening to the Buddha Dharma Pure and Simple Audiobook。May you find joy, inspiration, and peace in the Buddha Dharma。For more content, please subscribe to our channel.